it's going to be harder for you to get your confidence because gestures are a way that we underline or highlight our words. And so if you are inhibiting your own gestures, you will have a hard time. What happens if we don't use our hand gestures at all in a conversation, in a pitch, whatever, you know? Two things. One is it's harder for you to process. They've literally the found that- The person speaking, it's harder correct. to process. It's going to be harder for you to get your confidence because gestures are a way that we underline or highlight our words. And so if you are inhibiting your own gestures, you will have a hard time explaining Interesting. things. Interesting. They actually did a study where they had people explain two versions of a story. Notice two, two versions of the story. One, they could use their hands and one they couldn't. The one where they could use their hands, they had less pauses, they spoke more quickly, they used bigger words. Wow. And the one where they just couldn't, just their hands were just underneath their legs. You know what's interesting? I was just reading some intros for the podcast right uh -huh. before you came in. Uh -huh. I had another interview this morning and I did podcast intros and ads. And I use my hands in order to do it because I feel like it's coming across as like I'm really engaging. Yes, yes. And I remember when I was reading my first audio book, yeah. The School of Greatness, I tried to read it like just kind of like with my hands down for a while and I was like, I can't read. Like, you can't I, read. I've forgotten how to read my own words. <gasps> Being like dyslexic That's growing crazy. up anyways is... I'm a little slower when I read in general, but when I started to be like, okay, I just need to get in this with my body, my hands, I felt more confident. I felt like I could flow. I wasn't messing up as much. I wasn't having to stop and restart as much. It was yes. powerful. You, yes, okay, that's an incredible story about yeah. gesture because if you watch the best uh, like cartoon voiceover folks, they are using Animated, their, right? Yes, they are using their whole bodies. They're in a room by themselves like recording on a, on a mic, right? But they're yeah. like, la, la, la. Yeah, 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 if we just did the same thing, yes. Yeah, that's what they're doing. <laughs> that's not how they're I read my audio book, yeah. but yeah. But like Susan Goldwyn met research is called hearing gesture and that is because I'm using my hands right now not only for people watching but also for my folks who are listening because I know that the more I use my gestures the more charisma I have vocally and I would love to talk about vocal charisma interesting so that helps me but it also helps you so anyone who's watching you're getting so much information they ah. say 12.5 times more information from our gestures come on yes even when you can't see it uh, no, you have to be able to see it. So you can, we can hear charisma, but if someone can see our gestures, it adds more weight to what I'm saying. So when I say weight, I'm like, it's heavy. Look how heavy that is, right? But if I were to be like, heavy, oh. it's so heavy. And I, right. I kind of show it, shoo it away. You're like, no, it's not heavy. You can feel, you can feel the it. emphasis of the words. Yes, so it's like a highlighter. Now, I have to have a caveat here because mm -hmm. I've created a problem in the past. Yes. I love a gesture, but I don't like jazz hands, mm. right? So gestures are great. Hey, yeah. you see it. Hey, hey, hey Lewis. So you're like, oh, this is not you? credible or trustworthy. <laughs> you're like, this is some weirdo over here. I, I created a problem where I had people who were like entering their Zoom meetings and they were like, hello, Vanessa. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> don't do that. Oh no, no. So it's like a highlighter, mm. right? You wouldn't want to highlight the whole page. You just want to highlight the concepts that matter. So let's go back to hands for a second because you said there were 400 videos, I think you guys researched on Shark Tank. 495 and, pitches. And one of the main factors was waving as you were walking in or as you were getting planting. into mm -hmm. planting. Yes. Not all the way back, like Could waving. Be. Some of them did. But also once you sat there and said, hey, hey morning. sharks. Yes. Hey, sharks. Good morning. Happy to be here. Even this, happy to be mm -hmm. here, like an open palm gesture. Interesting. Okay. What are a few other things that you noticed? Okay. Yes. Okay. So we love gestures. And by the way, this is super easy on a video call, in person. Hey, nice to see you. Good morning. The biggest mistake we make, someone walks in and we go, hey, we give them a nod. Mm. Right? Give them a hand. That You like them enough to give them a hand. Right? So that's really easy. It's like every YouTube video, I'm like, hey, friends. That's literally how I start every video. Okay, that's the first thing. So the second thing is where things get more interesting. So remember that these sharks were in pitch after pitch after yeah, pitch. They're tired. They're they like are so tired. They are so tired. I've been on set there. I've cool, seen like cool. the whole day. It's just like it's a lot. It's a grind. It's a grind. Okay. So the most successful pitches, the next thing we found this was very, very clear, is that the more that the pitchers could spark dopamine, the more likely they were to get a deal. Now Dopamine is a very complicated chemical. So just for our purposes. Food, <laughs> eating something. No, giving them like, oh, try my. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was like, food, and yes, yes. And eating, like taste testing, exactly. like, try, like opening try something. Try it, taste it, smell it, lick feel it, it, touch yeah. it, feel it, wear it, play it. Mm. Any, of the, any of those senses. We love. Mm. So when we are doing something that's different, that's tactile. So yeah, touch, smell, taste, wear, play, do, try. 
that was going to wake the sharks up. Dopamine mm. is a little bit, it's a very complicated chemical, but I want to talk about it a little differently. It does feel good, right? So if, I, if they were to say to the sharks, sharks, today I have a gift for you. The brain goes, ooh, a gift, a gift, a gift, a gift. Mm. Oh, give me right, something. Gift, yeah. gift, gift, yeah. gift. Right, dopamine <laughs> is like that feeling of I want it, I want it, I want it. It's, it's an it's a excitement, but it's also motivation. So what they found is that when people have a lot of dopamine, they are more motivated to do things. They are more motivated to figure out a deal. They are more motivated to ask questions. So when a pitcher went in and not only had some kind of an interactivity, some kind of a surprise for them, and some of it, sometimes it was a surprise. And they would literally say, and guess what, sharks? Why? What? <laughs> right? Like, what is it? We want to know what that is because yeah. we're like dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. So it's, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to walk in every meeting and hand out and like throw, throw out Snickers bars. Right. Love a Snickers bar and that will work really well. <laughs> that will work. It will work every time. But it's also verbal surprise. Mm. So it's also saying, today I have something really special to share. Right? Anticipation. Anticipation. It doesn't even have to be something major. It can be throwing in those little elements of surprise that people can look forward to. And here's the, the biggest one. So this is research that uh, blew my mind. It changed the way that I write emails. So if you write a lot of emails, this study is for you. So let's, I'm going to break it down. It's kind of a complicated study. So here's okay. what they did. <clears throat> so researchers had participants come into their lab and do like a, a little quiz, like a little math test. One group of participants read a set of directions that was very simple. Please take the following quiz. Take your time. Use a pencil. Tell us when you're done. Very simple set of directions. The other participants got the same set of directions, but they sprinkled in a couple of achievement-oriented words. So achievement-oriented words are words like win, succeed, master, greatness. Mm. Okay? Those are yeah. achievement-oriented words. There's a reason why this is so, so powerful. In the directions, they would say something like, please master all these questions. Uh, take as much, as much time as you can to win the right answer. Right? So they just sprinkled in a couple of these words, two or three of these words. They found that participants who had the achievement-oriented words performed better. They actually got more answers correct. Interesting. Now, this is incredible. If you're a manager or a boss or you're working with people and you want them to perform at their best, just a couple of word swaps can help set them up for success. Mm. The second thing they found is that it also doubled, doubled participants' desire to keep working. Now, if this, they could win, succeed, achieve. Yeah. You know, any of these they were yeah. like, they worked on it longer, they worked on it harder, and they enjoyed it more. And the last one is, is that reading achievement-oriented words can change our own dopamine and testosterone. That's fascinating. You know, it's interesting because for years in high school and college, I had all, there was this store called Successions, I think it was called. I don't know if you remember this. Mm. It was like a motivational, inspirational oh. store that had like, I don't know, a poster of like an ego soaring with a quote, <laughs> right? Or like, Sounds just like some, my office. <laughs> like something was just like, it was like Ted Lasso, Love it. you know, store. Yes. It's just like, believe in yourself with like this. Where is this store? I want it. Okay. I think it's called Successions. I, okay. can't, I, can't, I can't remember the name of it. I don't even know if it's around anymore, but my dad bought me a lot of stuff and I had all this sports type of inspirational quotes and, you know, you know, Rocky <laughs> posters and all these things of just people achieving. And it, and I would stare in this like these walls and I should be like, I want to be that. Let me go take yes. the actions every morning to work a little bit harder to reach the goals. Mm -hmm. And I was just consumed so, in a success, you know, word. You were literally, word. yeah, you were literally priming yourself with those mm -hmm. cues. Another study, I promise I won't do too many more. They put a picture of an athlete winning a race on top of telemarketers scripts. The people who had the picture of the athlete winning. Come on earned more money. Come on. Yes. Like just in front of them? You're like... In literally a printed picture on their script. Oh, wow. So why I share this is because we do not realize that we are cueing people incorrectly or we are missing opportunities in every single email that we send. So if you send an email out to your team on Monday morning, hey, everyone, today is going to be a busy day. We have a lot of challenges. Let's make sure we're not late. Mm. Research has found that when people read words wow. like busy, challenge, or late, it literally primes them to be busier oh and later goodness. and more challenged. You are literally making it harder for them to help you. Mm. So if wow. instead you think about, and this is a challenge I would love to, if you're brave enough to take it, open up your email sent folder and pull up five emails you've sent to important people. Mm -hmm. Boss, partner, colleague, whatever, client. 
I want you to print those emails, and I want you to count the number of priming words you use. Good or bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even more, are they warm or are they competent? So this is where the next level happens. Ooh, give it to me. Highly charismatic people prime others with warmth and competence. This is what I was gonna say is one of the spark dopamine. A simple compliment or acknowledgement mm -hmm. sparks dopamine from, mm -hmm. from my experience. Just by seeing someone and acknowledging something you appreciate about them or you like about them or great shoes or whatever it is, I'm gonna sure you've got a great smile today, you've got good energy today, that sparks dopamine, right? Oh, 100%. Actually, this leads me to my next, my next third point, my Shark Tank point. We also noticed that when pitchers specifically acknowledged things from the sharks and sp specific sharks, they were more likely to get a deal from that shark. I really like this thing about yes. you. You did this Maury, amazing. I've been so looking forward to working with you. Robert, I love all your deals with all those athletes. Yeah. Mark, I've been a huge fan of yours yeah. for years. Or this was, this was the winning phrase. Give In a pitch, me. if we heard this phrase, it was a high <laughs> likelihood that someone was going to get a deal, which is, you remind me of myself. That could have been one of the sharks. That could have been one of the entrepreneurs. But the biggest compliment we can give someone is, you remind me of me. You're my role model. Mm. I put you in. So this is what we're talking about is kind of the next level here is I think that, yes, I want you to be your most charismatic self. I want everyone, hopefully, who's listening to be inspired mm. to be their warmest, most competent self. But what a bigger gift. What a better way to be great to gift other people to be their warmest and most mm. competent self. So that when you're sending an email and you say, hey, I'm introing Sarah, or we have Sarah on the call, or uh, here's that quick email intro I promised to Sarah, no priming words. What if instead you thought, what's the warmest and most competent mm -hmm. thing about both Sarah and the person I'm introducing to? And you say, hey, I'd love you to meet Sarah. She's been leading our marketing team for 10 years. We are so lucky to have her. Mm -hmm. She's a gem. Lucky, gem, mm -hmm. leader. That is the mm. perfect balance of warmth and competence. And you are gifting that to both Sarah, the person you're interviewing to, and yourself. And so I think, I think our words are gifts. And this doesn't have to be every email. But in your most important emails, that, you, the, that audit that you send, count how many warm words are you using. So warm words are um, words that uh, trigger connection, trust, um, words that make you feel the warm and fuzzies. They're very oxytocin words. Count the number of competent words. Efficient, productive, brainstorm, leverage, lead, streamline. Those are all great competence words. Uh, note, a funny note here is um, emojis. Are they good or bad? Highly warm. Right. Not good well, or bad. Like you can have likability, like connection. Right. Yeah. High, high warmth, right? So emojis and exclamation points count as one warm word. Wow. So if you have someone, and this happens a lot, where people send a highly warm email to an important person. Hi, friend. Friend, warm word, exclamation point, two warm words. I loved talking to you yesterday, three warm words. Mm. It was so exciting to catch up. Exciting, catch up, five warm words. Heart emoji, heart smiley face. Right. Now we're at seven warm words and we're one <laughs> sentence in, right? Yeah. They wonder why they're not taken seriously. They're one, they wonder why they didn't get a follow-up interview. They wonder why that person takes four days to reply. Mm. It's because it's too much warmth. You have to balance it out with the competence. So I want you to count and see what kind of signals are you sending to the people who matter to you. That's interesting. Do you want to? You know, you're, you're bringing up something I used to do years ago when no one knew who I was. I was just getting started in 2007, 2008. Oh, yeah. I used LinkedIn as a tool to create connection with people that were, you know, successful business leaders and people that had done things that I wanted to do in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And for a while, none of them would reply to me because I started off saying like, hey, I'm just getting started, I'm brand new, and I'm looking for some advice, can you help me? Those types of- Yeah, warm, 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 Languages, warm. right, yeah. yeah all, all those words you just said are all warm. Yeah, and I started switching it and getting a reply almost every time from anyone. Mm. Like anyone I'd reach out to, I was like, they're gonna reply to this. Oh. And I started doing uh, a few things. In the first sentence, I would just try to find, you know, spark dopamine, essentially, is what, yeah. what I was doing. I was looking for a mutual connection we had, and okay. I'd speak about the mutual connection. Mutual connection is highly competent. It's mm -hmm. saying, you know this person, I know them too, it's I'm trust. in the know. Trust and, and, and warmth. Trust. Yeah. Warmth and competence. This person likes me, if you like them, yeah, trust. Perfect balance, yeah. I didn't even know that, and I was just doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And it was working. I was like, okay, let me keep doing this. Let me yeah. find someone that we know in common. Yeah. And I would always try to have a conversation to get some intel on them. For Can sure. you tell me something about so-and-so? 
and I would speak about that information mm. and, I, and I would speak into them. I would also look for a couple other areas of interest that we have in common. And I would try to have three different things in common mm. in the first sentence or two. Wow. You know, something that they did that I'd experienced before or a place they're, they're from or whatever, some, some mutual interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, warmth, warmth and competence. Maybe that's competence, maybe. Or it's both. Both. Saying, yeah. It's beautifully both. Yeah. So I would do that, and then I would just add, and then I would say something like, I'm really inspired by what you created. I'd love to learn your story of success. Ooh, ooh, As wait, wait. To, say it again. Say it again. Say I'm it. really inspired I'm, by what, what you've you created. created. I'd love well, to, learn to learn your, your story, story of, of success. success. Oh, man, that just gave me the chills. That's essentially what I did almost every email. That sentence. Can we just like talk about it? So sure. that sentence is the perfect blend of warmth and competence. There you go. Right? You have love. You have learn. You have success. And so that didn't take a lot of words. It's not like you no. were writing them a six-paragraph no. email. But it's so much better than let me know if you have any questions. Right. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> or can I pick your brain for coffee? Yeah, oh. exactly. You know? Yeah. So I think what we have to do is there are hidden opportunities waiting for you in your texts, mm. in your emails, in your profiles, if you choose to take them. Yeah. And all it takes is a couple of word swaps. Like I'm not talking yeah, about 15, I'm, in that direction sheet, they sprinkled in like two or three words, mm -hmm. win. Re even reading the word win makes the other person think more like a winner. Yeah. What a gift to give. Yeah, that's cool. The, the quote that I heard in high school from Roosevelt is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Ah. Saved my life, literally. Because, That's warmth and competence right be, there. Because I didn't feel competent my entire school life, right? Mm. In school, I was at the bottom of my class. I just graded poorly, which confirmed like I'm not smart enough. Or, like I'll never be able to be as intelligent as my classmates or anyone in the world. Yeah. So why would anyone like me or trust me because I didn't feel competent? Mm. Then when I heard that quote, I go, I have a chance. Like... I can build competence in another area of life. I can be emotionally intelligent and I can show people how much I care. And by doing that, that's been pretty much my whole life. Everyone who's listening, I hope what this shows you is that caring about someone, mm -hmm. there's multiple ways to do that. Yes, it's emotionally intelligent, but it's also honoring someone's cues or mm -hmm. gifting them the right cues. Yes. When you make someone feel more like a winner, what a gift you just gave them. Huge gift. You're putting confidence into them. You're speaking joy, yes. confidence into that person. Yes, you're literally gifting them the chemical mm -hmm. dopamine so that they themselves have more motivation. Yes. And don't we all need more motivation? Absolutely, yeah. Um, can I, since you shared a vulnerability, can I share a vulnerability sure. and a compliment? Sure. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So I've been so excited to tell you this. So your book, School uh -huh. of Greatness, uh -huh. um, I love the cover. I just thought it was so inspiring. And when I was taking my cover shoot for Captivate, uh, so this is six years ago now, it was not going well. Uh -huh. I was super awkward. My my photographer, amazing uh, Maggie Kirkland, was like, "Listen, like this isn't working. You're really awkward. I need you to relax." Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't relax. Right? The worst thing you can do to someone who's anxious is tell them to relax. So we weren't getting the shot. We weren't getting the pictures. And she's like, "Okay, just think about your role models. Who's your role model?" Mm -hmm. I was like, "Lewis House." So she pulls up your book, <laughs> and she goes, "Okay." And she said, "Look at Lewis. Mm -hmm. Channel him." And so in the shoot, I channeled you and I, I did your pose of my hands mm -hmm. over my stomach with your face. And crazily enough, that is the Captivate that cover. Was a shot. I'm going to send you the How full version. How many books version. you sell? How many copies you get? A lot, no. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. I better, I better send you some royalties. <laughs> so anyway, I channeled That's you cool. because that even that cue, there was something about it. So I, I thank you for even the cues that you send out because that mm. gifted me confidence when yeah. you didn't even know about there it. There you go. I appreciate it. I'm glad, I'm glad it worked. You said you wanted to talk about something in the beginning mm -hmm. about personalities. I did. Mm -hmm. Now, what is this? specifically yes so <laughs> you're like i don't know about this stuff let's hear it <laughs> so when we talk about signs of personality there's a lot of things out there disc and enneagram uh -huh. and myers-briggs and yeah. all these things the only one that is scientifically based is the big five and it's five personality it's like traits five love languages it's it's we, we talk about the five love languages <laughs> yeah. actually that's a good one too yeah. um so there's like special five five love languages and the five yeah, big five it. yes um, i know that's not scientific the love languages actually although I mean, it seems there is some science very practical there yeah. is some science behind it yeah yeah there is um and the big five has has a lot okay. um and so everyone has these big five personality traits and they're either high or low in them it's one or the other 
It's high, it's, low. There's no middle. There is middle. It, it is a spectrum. This is the biggest difference between like Myers Briggs that like labels you like an extrovert or introvert. Yes. Like a lot of people like really struggle like, with that uh, label. Well, I'm kind of both, or I'm in the middle. Exactly. Yeah. So it's all every trait is a spectrum, and like we have yeah. like a like a nice spectrum, and you kind of place yourself on it. A lot of these personality traits are not our choice. So that is why I brought up the serotonin thing for neuroticism. The greatest understanding that we can have about ourselves mm. is to know that our reactions, our emotional reactions, are part of how we are wired. So a lot of the times, like you feel guilty or jealous or um, all these dirty emotions, right? The, the negative mm. emotions that we don't like to feel. And yes. then we judge ourselves for them. Yes. I'm like, oh, I'm so not gracious right now. I'm so <laughs> not feeling my gratitude, yes. right? <laughs> But actually, your optimism or your negativity is, is wired within you. So you're better off trying to figure out what are my triggers, mm -hmm. how am I natural wired, and how can I optimize that? So we talked about openness, right? Figuring out how you can balance routine versus something new. Right. Talked a little bit about neuroticism. The other one that I wanted to bring up was conscientiousness. So okay. conscientiousness in a relationship, uh, studies have found that this is the biggest one, that if you have a difference in your partner's conscientiousness, you have the most relationship problems. Say it again. So if you are different than your partner's conscientiousness, scientifically speaking, you're more likely to have more relationship problems. Okay. So, so conscientiousness, yeah. yeah, conscientiousness is how you approach detail. So high conscientious people, this would be me, we love to do Details lists. Of everything. Details, alphabetizing, yes. steps, routine. Like we love like lots of things. And if your partner is like, uh, I could care less about it, and it's like, oh, loosey goosey, like, so, hey, you know, we'll get it to it someday. <laughs> Low conscientiousness <laughs> is exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah. Big ideas. Yeah. Strategy. Doesn't want to get bogged down in the details. <laughs> <laughs> this is you, right? It's not me. I like the detail, but I just see where you're coming from. <laughs> right. It's funny, yeah. Right. And so what happens is, is you have people who are like, hey, let's plan a vacation. I have a color-coded spreadsheet with all the different possible <laughs> locations and approximate weather in those locations. And then you have the yes. low, open, low conscientious person who's like, let's just fly to a place and figure it out when we get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a, like I like a, that too. It, so I think you're in the yeah, middle. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm in the middle. Here's the thing, because I love big ideas and yeah. I love strategizing about them. But I know as an athlete, you've got to execute on a daily basis if you want to make them happen. Ooh, that's a different thing what you just said there. Okay. So, so listen. So, so here's what I do now. Then tell me what you're going to say. Okay. So I come up with the ideas and then I hire the people who are very detailed and say, run with it. So I can come up with more big ideas and then bring them back to you and say, now we're going to do this. Now run with that. So okay. I you know, hire people with those strengths to work with me on that. The way that, I don't know if you guys heard what Lewis just said, mm. which is, that is so free trade theory. So what, what you said is, I basically, I optimize. Yes. I know that details are important as an athlete. Yes. I know that details are important in my business. So either I work those details out in a workout routine or I hire those people. Mm -hmm. So that is a great example of how you can take what you naturally are and then free trade there, optimize it right. so that you leverage it up. So I would mm -hmm. say that you're probably medium low, Yeah. but you know how to turn it up in the areas that, it, mm -hmm. that it's needed, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the reasons why you're so successful. It, it depends too. As an athlete, I, didn't ha I couldn't hire anyone to do the work for me. It was like I had to train mm -hmm. all day. I had to do the mm -hmm. research. I, had to, you know, I was constantly studying game film. I was practicing. I was doing everything myself. So yeah, I, I can't export it. Yeah, you can't. You got to you gotta do it yourself as an athlete. So... Um, so I understood it, but now that I have more resources and, you know, different part of my life, I can optimize the thing that I like doing the most. And I, I think that that is the key to happiness, mm -hmm. right? Like we, I did a whole, um, two year study on happiness and we can get into if you'd like to. Did you write a book about it? I didn't yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. I have an online course on it, but I didn't yeah, write yeah. a book on it yet. <laughs> um, and I wrote it from the place of like, I'm also not a naturally like a happy person. Mm -hmm. Like I am a worrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, I really have to work at it. Yeah. And um, what I learned was, is that it's actually not the big things that make you happy. It's the little things, including. Like the cup of coffee you're going to get later as a treat. Yeah. Like the smell of the coffee, like mm. the amazing juice at creation, whatever. Oh. Right. Like, oh, the, sm the smoothness. Of it. By the way, everyone, I went to I went to creation with Lewis, yes. and you downed your juice faster than I could drink. <laughs> <Have a sip. laughs> it, was, it was impressive. I was like, "Where did it go? It was magic." Yeah. Um, so yeah, so saving those things, and also those moments where you have optimized your natural personality instead mm -hmm. of changing it. Right. That is where happiness comes from. When mm -hmm. you can say, I'm a big idea person. I love creativity. I love strategizing. I love big ideas and big pictures. 
getting bogged down in the details is necessary, but I don't like mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I'm going to find a way to either outsource it or minimize it so I yeah. can focus on those things. That feeling of capability, that feeling of control is incredibly happiness making. Contro- control is a is a very happy making yeah. emotion. It's you know we think about happiness as like pleasure and joy and um, ecstasy, but actually you know the words for happiness are control, capability, like feeling and like you're in control, right? Feel- Not like controlling people or something, Sorry, but yes. feeling like you're in control of your results or yes. your life. Yes, like, and and one example of this that um, I like thinking about is um, there's this this thing called the Tetris effect. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. So these researchers had students. The Tetris, Tetris effect. <laughs> Tetris. <laughs> they said the Tetris. I was like Tetris effect. What's no, the Tetris, Tetris effect? Tetris, Tetris effect. effect. But it. I like that one too. That's very happy. Touching making. effect is good too. <laughs> yeah, that's good too. Yes, we can hand hug later if you want. Yeah. Hand hug, yeah. Yeah, so this this <laughs> is not as fun effect. as the, te- the Tetris effect, yes. So what researchers did, this was not a study on happiness. But mm. They brought research, they brought students in, they had them play Tetris for like four hours. Mm, sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> I haven't played Tetris in probably 20 years, but addictive. I used to love playing like, games all the time. It is addictive, yeah. yeah. So they, they were testing something about the brain. And an unexpected result of this study is that students left the lab and we're literally seeing their entire life like a Tetris board. They wanted to rearrange their furniture like Tetris. They wanted to like stand in line like Tetris. They wanted to reorganize their shelving like Tetris. And they realized it in a weird way. They had primed the brain to think in a Tetris-like pattern. Mm. So what happens is, is typically humans have a negativity bias. We are trained to see the negative things in the world, the bad things. This is a survival mechanism, right? As cavemen, we had to go, hmm, it might rain. I better get ahead. I should really forage for the winter. Right. I sh-, you know, like We are trained to see all the problems and potential things that could go wrong so we could prepare ourselves. Yes. So our bias, our training is negative, negative, negative. We open our email and go, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Right? We walk into a room and we're like, who don't I know? Why don't I belong? I'm not saying everyone has this, but there's yes. certain extremes. I think that we can retrain our brain, just like the Tetris effect, to see in happiness patterns. Mm. So instead of walking into a room and being like, oh, I don't belong. I don't know anyone. Thinking about why do I belong? Who can I know? Right? That's a very different kind of framework mm-hmm. to see the world. Yeah. And so I think that that's about control. Right? That, that's bringing control into a negative mindset and flipping it sure. so that it's not necessarily positive. You just know where your frame is coming yeah, from. Yeah. Okay. Control. What was the other thing? Control, capability, and optimization. That's so, the key to happiness. Th- those three things <clears throat> are, I think are the key to happiness. Yes. Wow. Okay. Cool. And I think that they're under, underappreciated. I got it. Got especially it. with capability. Okay. So where else did I get us off track? I think I got us off track. Okay. I got like down the happiness. <clears throat> you were going to say, so we we're talking head. about personality something, right? Yes. So the last thing I was going to say was with conscientiousness <clears throat> is um, thinking about if your partner is a big idea person yes. or a detail person. Same with your well, colleagues. Yeah, you said in most conflict of this is the things. most conflicts where you have, why didn't you clean up? I did clean up. This isn't clean. Not the way time. I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So do you guys, you and your partner, your husband, are you guys complete opposites in that space then? or are you? He is much lower conscientious than I am. So how does that work? So we figured it out. So for example, we, we figured out what needs to be changed and what doesn't. So like, for example, I like an organized sock drawer. Mm-hmm. My husband doesn't care if he's wearing whatever, whatever on his feet, yeah. right? So we have, after many months of being like, did you get your socks? Did you fold your socks? Your socks are everywhere. I was like, you know what? Like that is his drawer. We do not share a drawer any longer. He has his side of the closet. That's what he wants. Have my, have my yeah. side of the closet. <laughs> so instead of trying to change him and teach him how to have a better sock drawer, I was like, no, like, that's a waste of both of our it's – not, it's not real to who we are. I'd rather have us optimize and say that's his, this is mine. That's a really small example, a very like concrete example, but there's bigger ones as well. For example, if you are talking about um, a friendship or how you want to raise children – Someone who is high conscientious mm-hmm. is going to want to break down all the details and plan for every eventuality. Where someone who's a big picture person is going to be like, let's let's meet the kid and let's see what, what we think. <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah. And those can be major value differences. Mm. So instead of getting angry at them or trying to convince them to be more like you, big idea or detailed, the better conversation is, why don't you want to pre-plan? Or why do you think that going by the seat of your pants is better? Like, where, where is the value there? How can we pick this based on actual strengths and not how we're wired? Mm-hmm. 
So I think that's a very different kind of conversation to have. So yeah. the, those the, the three things, the ones I would focus on is how organized someone is, how big of an like, open, adventurous someone is, and how much of a warrior someone is. And it's okay if they're opposite on both totally those, okay. all those things with you, but you just have to figure out how to optimize them. And by the way, if you're single, I think that one of the things to think about is like, what is your ideal personality match? I know this is a crazy, this is a crazy way to think about dating. Like most people are like, they don't think about this, but yeah. like, I think that if you're That's dating, where a lot of stress comes from a, a lot, a lot of pain and suffering in a relationship comes from yes. This. And I think that like a really fun, maybe this is me, this is my idea of fun. I think a really fun conversation you can have in the beginning of a relationship, the first few dates, is like, so like I read this book or I listened to this podcast on personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, are you are you a big idea person or a detail person? Are you a morning yeah. person or are you a night person? Right, like those kind of conversations early are so much better than when they normally come out, which is on the first fight. As opposed to just having like this chemical attraction and being like, oh, we love each other. And it's <laughs> right. like, you know, right. we'll figure it all out constantly. And yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and remember that people will free trade that they'll optimize during the lust phase so that you don't actually know Until, how much they are. Yeah. This happened to me recently. I hired a developer and in his interview process, he came across as very high conscientious. He sent phases, sent the proposal. I was like, great. This is wonderful because I work well with other high conscientious people. But he optimized for me during the interview process because I did not, of course. Put his best foot forward. Of yeah. course. So I didn't ask the right questions, which should have been. So over the course of this eight-month project, how do you like to work? Are you a weekly check-in kind of a person? Are yeah, you? I kind of like to check-in <laughs> once in a while. And yeah. then I would have, I would have immediately found like, out. Like, oh, it's not a good fit. Yeah. And then I would have been like, shoot, mm. he's a kind of do it as you do it kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't know to ask those questions. So I think in the beginning of all relationships, the best thing we can do <sighs> is don't let the lust overcome us. Right? It's tough. Stop that line. So That's tough. In personal right relationships and business relationships, all that. Yeah. And I've seen in dating profiles, people will put their MBTI in dating profiles sometimes. MBTI? The Myers Briggs, oh, like they ENFJ will? or INFC. In dating profiles? I've seen it. I have seen it in dating people profiles. People are obsessed with that stuff. People I forget are what I, I always, Someone always tells me what I am, but I forget it. Um, I can't remember. ENFJ? I think so, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But that Myers Briggs, remember, is not scientifically based. Know, like, yeah. Because it because also we do change <clears throat> over time slightly and it's hard if you have one label, like if like if you're just E, it gives you very little wiggle room. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. There's another uh personality test with four quadrants. Have you seen this? Disc. Is that what Disc. it is? Like, Where it's promoter, supporter, analyzer, controller. Yes. Have you seen that? I think that I think that that's disc, but disc? I've seen that one, yes. Promoter, supporter, analyzer, controller. And you kind of like, you rank, you go through a quiz of mm -hmm. figuring out which quadrant you're the highest at. Yeah. So you'd be, you know, I'm a promoter controller. Yeah. I'm first off a promoter, I'm like a big idea. I'm passionate. I'm like excited. Let's go. Let's do this. Yeah. I like to be in control. I like to, you know, have all those things. Uh, and then it's support, analyze. It's kind of like the top four. But really, I'm like very close to almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Like all of them are pretty mm -hmm. high. So I'm almost like very spread out. Yeah. And like the true leaders I hear is what they say is like you want to be able to tap into each quadrant right. to connect to an analyzer. If they're an analyzer, you want to be able to be analytical with them. Mm -hmm. If they're a promoter, you want to be promoting with them. Mm. If they're a supporter, you want to be in support with them. Yeah. So you're always meeting someone where they're at, yes. not trying to have them meet you where you're at. So it's like a flexible leadership style. Flexible leadership. That is the same thing with emotional intelligence. It is, this is emotional intelligence. Yeah. That's what it is. And, yeah. and it's the exact same thing with that and also like expressiveness. Yes. For example, like um, from a nonverbal perspective, if someone um, shows up and they're like super bubbly and super excited and the other person's like kind of calm. No. It's a mismatch. You got to meet them where they're at. Yeah, you got to meet them you where they're at. A little bit ahead, and, you know, try to get them to that space, but yeah, I, I think that matching and mirroring is an interesting yes. way to think about interactions, especially like phone calls. Um, we're doing a bunch of research right now on vocal power, mm. and which you think about vocal power probably all the time because a lot of people are listening. Right. Um, so what we found was well, there's there's an interesting anchor study here where um, they looked at doctors. And they found that doctors who record 10-second voice tone clips, so, hello, my name is Dr. Edwards. I work at Children's Presbyterian Hospital, and I specialize in oncology, something like that. They took those clips, and they warbled the words, so you couldn't understand the words that were being said. So it was, <laughs> they asked people to rate those clips <clears throat> on intelligence, warmth, competence. Mm. Now, imagine this for a second. Like, you hear a clip of, like, gobbledygook. How could you rate it? E yeah, yeah. Exact. How could you? But people do. Mm. They found that the doctors who got rated the lowest in intelligence and warmth also had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. Wow. Yeah. Just based on confidence and voice. Somehow, huh. 
We don't sue people. We don't sue doctors based on their actual skills. We sue doctors based on our perception of their skills. So in your voice, how they show up, how they sound, it does not have to do with the verbal. Remember how at the very beginning I was like, whatever you say in those first few seconds is actually not as important as what you're showing up as. Mm -hmm. We even catch that on the phone. So your vocal power, you know, how you say, hello. Mm -hmm. And like, what's interesting is the biggest mistake people make. Hello. Oh my God. (laughs) Hello. What? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So tone, cadence, and pitch. Also another one is like people will hold their breath while they answer. So they go, hello. Mm. That's the highest end of my vocal range. I'm working very hard right now to keep my vocal range in the lowest possible range because it's more calm and relaxed. Much more calm. It has a better resonance. Right. A better resonance point. So if you hear yourself and you hear yourself going a little bit higher in your range, it's not the, good. The best thing you can do is actually speak on the out breath. So if you hear the difference, so I'm going to make myself go tense. So if I get really excited and I tense my vocal cord, I, I sound a little bit nervous, a little bit more like a child. Now, if I speak on the out breath, it forces the words out, it relaxes my vocal cords, and it makes me sound more resonant. Mm-hmm. So the best thing you can do is actually answer on the out breath. So not hello versus hello. A very, like a very different. Actor, <laughs> yeah. like, All these careers right, I could do. Exactly. It's funny. I heard uh, my brother told me that he read some science project or something where research on when he's on the phone, he smiles when he's like uh, saying goodbye. Yes. He's like smiling in the last like 30 seconds. And he says people can feel that on the other side. Yes. Okay. So he, that is absolutely right. Um, there are 16 different kinds of smiles that can be detected from voice tone alone. Wow. Uh, yeah. 16. 16 different kinds of smiles. What's interesting is we're on our vocal study that we're doing right now. And we haven't published these research, this research yet, but it's super interesting. We found mm. preliminary results. We had the same people record hello with different body language expressions. Like, hello. E- exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, slunched so, so, over. So, so, like, so, well, we can do it right now, actually. Let's, let's try hello. it. See if you can guess what we're doing. So, like, let's do, like, this one. Like, really. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Right. Versus. Hello. Hello. Right. So, like, that's low power versus high yeah, power. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, it's supposed to change our voice. Now, we make yeah. them do it for a little bit longer because yeah. it's, it's very quick. Yeah. And we also have them do micro expressions. So, happiness micro expression, anger micro expression, which is when you pull your eyebrows together, mm. harden your lips, um, versus uh, sadness micro expressions. So that's when you pinch your inner corners together. Yep. Um, and we had them record hellos. Wow. And then we had people in our lab or participants, and you can go play if you want, listen to these clips and rate them on warmth, competence, and charisma. The same person will get totally different ratings based on how they are holding their face and their body. So how you hold yourself on the phone matters. This is the same thing we were talking about earlier, which is like, what do you want to infect, right? If you answer the phone sad and anxious and distracted, not only do people perceive you as sad, anxious, distracted, they catch those emotions too. So what's the best thing people should do before they answer the phone? Out breath. So not holding your breath in. So like if you can take one or two deep breaths before you answer, it will relax your vocal cord, right? So you're like picking it up. Who is it? Yeah, a couple deep breaths and then hello. So that's the first thing you can do. It relaxes your vocal cords. Should you say hello? Or if it's a friend, you're like, hey, what's up? Either one. Good looking. Either one. I like that. I like that even better. That's a compliment. I like a compliment. Anyway, yeah. So so like, hey, this is Lewis. Hello. Hey, buddy, what's up? Yeah. Right. So one so or two deep breaths. It doesn't matter what you say. Exactly. It's the energy and how you're saying it. Yeah. Just like when you're meeting a person. Exactly. So breath. Yes. Breath. Oh, I didn't get an explosion. Yes. Breath. <laughs> I'm not cool like that. You are cool. I cannot do a fist bump you're like cool. that. Can we just like wave at each other? That's like way more comfortable for me. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. So out breath is actually the most important one. Oh. Um if you can do it, the second one would be to try to actually just be as expressive as they are. So if you hear that, so you you say hello, right? And they're like, hey, what's up? Oh, hey, what's up? Yeah, hey, yeah. what's up? Right, like that match is like an instant, mm-hmm. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. I'm on the same page. Sure. Okay. Especially for business. Yeah, yeah. Especially That's for business. Great. What's another thing yeah. that in the shark tank? We're talking yes. about sparking dopamine. What else? Okay, so we talked about reading. We talked about dopamine. We talked about interactivity. Uh-huh. We talked about... Um, complimenting in a way that allows someone to see themselves in you or pulling mm-hmm. out a similarity, That's good. right? So like, you know, like you, Lori, we really value. Mm-hmm. Um, Mr. Wonderful, we love Mr. Wonderful products, <laughs> right? Like that really helped. I mean, it sounds like sucking up, but actually it, it 
<laughs> it really it works. works. It really worked. The other thing that we noticed about the interactivity is what they would do is they would cross space zones. So they would have something to give the sharks and they would go mm. from the carpet to the chairs. That worked usually. That worked because they were going into intimate zone very quickly. So this is called a nonverbal bridge. It's kind of an advanced technique. Do you want to talk about it? Yes. Okay. So a nonverbal bridge is a way that we cross into someone's intimate space, but safely. So what happens is when we're with someone, we want to connect with them. We want more oxytocin. We want to bond with them. Yes. But sometimes it can be hard to break that boundary. A nonverbal bridge is a way that we can create oxytocin with permission. So that could be handing someone something. That could be giving a high five. That could be touching their elbow. And that is exactly what successful pitchers did. They would have a reason or an excuse to, hey, Lauren, let me guide you up here. Hey, Kevin, let me zip on this suit for you. Mm. Hey, um, you want to try this amazing uh, cinnamon roll? And when they did that, they created these small little bridges. So what I would think right. about is like, how can you create bridges to people where you're engaging them even physically? Right, and that's harder on video, but in person, that was a thing that we found in the, right. in the tank. How do you do it in a way that the person feels comfortable if you touch them on the elbow? Because someone may not feel comfortable. Right. So you have to be really intuitive to, you know, is this person going to be receptive to me? Are they already interested enough where I can yes. get closer? Yes, yes. Not Are just, they leaning in? Yeah. Are they giving eye contact? Are they nodding? Oh, I forgot another one that was really important. So um, vocal power. So we haven't really talked about vocal power. And this was a big one in the tank. So we hear confidence. We hear competence. And the biggest way that we do this is with inflection. Mm -hmm. So inflection is uh, the biggest mistake that we make is the question inflection. So the question inflection is when we go up at the end of our sentences. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's also yeah. called up talk. So if I were to... But don't do up talk. Don't do up talk. Okay. We're going to talk about why. Yes. So when we use the question inflection, it cues the other person's brain to know, ah, we're being asked a question. The problem is, is that when we accidentally use the question inflection, it makes people question you. Right? Are they really trustworthy? They really tr right. So what would happen is in this study where they looked at doctors, they found that the doctors who had, uh, so I'll break down the study. So what they did is they asked doctors to record 10 second voice tone clips. Mm -hmm. And they said like their name, their specialty, where they worked. So it sounded like, <clears throat> hi, my name is Dr. Edwards. I work in oncology. I specialize in uh, children's medicine, something like that. They took the clips and they warbled the words. So you couldn't understand the actual words being said. So it sounded like, right? Yeah. Then they asked people to rate these clips on warmth huh. and competence, mm. right? Again, this research has been repeated over and over again. Imagine this for a second. You're asked to listen to a clip of gobbledygook. Mm, yeah, to see if they're to, competent so, and they're trustworthy. Are they trustworthy. smart? Yeah. Are they, well, are they, do you like them? Yeah. And people do it. What they found is the doctors who had the lowest warmth and competence ratings had the highest rate of malpractice lawsuits. Wow. That implies that we don't just sue doctors based on their skills. We sue doctors based on our perception of their skills, and that happens in the first few seconds of hearing them. So your communication is everything. Everything. It's not just the words you're using. Are they warm? Are they competent? It's even how you're saying the words. Wow. So the very first story I break down in the book, and this is in the intro, so if you want to just look at the sample chapter, you could. I analyzed Jamie Siminoff's pitch. Jamie Siminoff is the founder of Ring. That didn't get didn't any money, get. then it sold for a billion dollars. Thank yeah. yes. Here is a brilliant guy, right? Jamie Siminoff is brilliant. He had a successful product, right? Ring is a very successful product. Amazon acquired it for over a billion with a B dollars. Yet, he goes into the pitch in the Shark Tank and he pitches and he doesn't get a deal. Why? That pitch plagued me. Because I was like, here is a smart guy with a great yeah. idea. But his cues were the problem. The, I think that he lost his pitch. And I, this is a really, big, a really big statement. And if you listen to it, you'll hear it. I think he lost the deal in the first 10 seconds of them hearing him. And the reason is, is he made the choice to close the doors to the tank. So in his pitch, he doesn't walk down the hallway. You don't see that long first impression. Mm. You don't get public to social to personal. He closed the doors. And what he did is he went... He knocked on the door of the they're shark like, tank. Hello, who's and they're there? Like, uh -huh. They're like, hello. And he goes, it's Jamie. Uh -huh. So he asked his own name. And when you're a shark and you're mm -hmm. trying to make a very quick first impression of someone without seeing them and you hear the question inflection that's supposed to be used on a statement, you immediately begin to question, I don't know. 
And that is also because we know that liars are more likely to use the question reflection. If you've ever played a two truths and a lie, have you ever played that game? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so two truths and a lie. Here's a little tip for everyone. If you ever yeah, play yeah. that game, people almost always ask the lie. So they'll be like, oh yeah, two truths and a lie. Um, I uh, have a goldfish. I am a vegetarian and I love dogs. Mm. They almost always go up on their lie. And that's because we, when we're lying, we don't know if you believe us. Mm-hmm. So subconsciously we give it away. So Jamie starts his pitch and he doesn't have a first impression. He doesn't do any greeting in the hallway. He misses that whole walk up. The very first words out of his mouth, doesn't even matter what he says, is, right, up, 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 mm-hmm. And then Mark Cuban says, uh, are you here to pitch? And he says, here to pitch? Again, using the question inflection. I think that what happened was, is it gave away his competence. Huh. And then the doors open, right? And he explains this idea of ring, it's a doorbell. The problem is, is his first impression was very low in competence. And so he had a lot of trouble having the sharks take him seriously. He was a very competent individual building his business, right? He was very smart, very. intelligent, knew the technology, how to build product, teams, all these things, get sales, whatever it was. But the warmth wasn't there as well, it seems like, right? Like he, the trustworthy, charisma, warmth, yes, confidence. he under signaled every step of the way. Mm. So he under, under signaled warmth, he under signaled competence, and then was trying to dial up competence. Yeah. And you hear in the rest of the pitch, he's, he's trying to build it back yeah. up. He's like, yes. but we've done this, and look, we've got this, this technology. And this, and this money, and then this. And so he cannot get it back. He could wow. not get it back. And so I think I watched that pitch and I break it down in the book of what happened to this brilliant guy who yeah. had one bad day. And I think that if he, he, you know, he scripted those answers, he prepared for that pitch, and he had really good verbal answers. There was even a couple times where I think this thing happens for people who over rehearse. So if you have an interview or a presentation, what do you do? You rehearse it, right? You practice the perfect yes. answer. That can get in your way though, because if you practice the perfect answer, this is exactly what happened to Simonoff, and very highly intelligent people do this. He would hear a question from a shark, usually a challenging question, because they were like really pushing him on the deal, and they didn't believe him. No one believed him. They all thought, oh no, it's too crowded of a market, it will never work. They literally said that to him, (laughs) okay, I have ring on my front door. And they literally said never. He could not get them to believe him, because what would happen was, is they would ask him a question, he would start to answer it organically, and then he would switch into his rehearsed answer. Oh, man. So you would hear, oh, oh yeah, yeah, we do have market track. Our market traction has been wonderful. In fact, in the last mm. five years, we've done X numbers. And you would be like, who is this robot? Yeah, just say what's on just, your heart. Yeah, yeah, just say it organically. Right. And so I think um, you can be the smartest person in the world. You could have the best ideas. But if you don't share them right, you're not helping people help you. And so that, that's my, it drives me crazy when smart people can't get their ideas heard. And that pitch crushed me. I felt so bad for him. And he made it. He's okay now, right? He's, right? He's doing yeah. really well. And then he was like a guest shark or and, whatever, yeah. Okay, and what's amazing is when you watch him walk into the tank as a shark, you can see the difference. You can feel it's the difference. The confidence, Oh, yeah. my, you know, he walks into the tank. He walks down the hallway, right? He walks down the hallway. He's smiling. He gestures. Hey, everyone, good to see you. He shakes hands. He does all the things he didn't do in that original mm. pitch. And um, you can see the difference. And it has any, he's the same person. Same person, same ideas, similar suits. Yeah, he looks like a different person. Fascinating. It's not about what you say. It's how you say it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. How you present yourself and your words. Uh, and your words? No. And, and your No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm, cu- I'm curious about this. There's a big topic out there right now. I just did a recent interview with uh, Dr. Romney, who... Mm-hmm is a therapist, psychologist, talking about narcissism a lot today. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me the difference between charisma and narcissism? Mm -hmm. And how can you spot when someone is actually warm and caring and charismatic versus someone who uses the skills or Mm -hmm. the tools of charisma Mm -hmm. in their narcissistic (laughs) approach towards (laughs) manipulating, controlling, and getting what they want in life? So uh, this is my biggest fear with this book. This This is my single biggest fear, and it... Uh, was an issue for me when I first started mm. writing it. Is I'll be honest, you can use this book for manipulation. Yeah, of course. And that scares me. And when a smart person who's narcissistic Ooh. is going to study everything and Ooh, then start using it, it scares me. So how can you so, tell the difference? The subtle cues. Yeah. These are very subtle now. Very subtle. Yeah. So we're talking about big to subtle, right? There's like a range uh-huh. of them. So first is it is my biggest fear with this book that people do not have the right intentions. 
And my hope is that we can actually use these powers for good and not evil. That is the number one thing is you, you can if you want to. Here's the good news. There are certain cues that we cannot control. And if you have bad intentions, they will leak. So I call these danger zone cues. So in the book I talk about there's four different types of cues. There's highly warm, nonverbal, verbal, and vocal. So these are things that make you highly warm, highly trustworthy, highly likable. There's highly competent cues, verbal, nonverbal, and vocal. And then there's charismatic. The ones that are just knock it out of the park. Like they're just great. And the last one is danger zone cues. Danger zone cues are the cues that get us into trouble. They're the cues that liars use. Ooh. They're the way that we leak guilt and shame. Actually, shame is not a bad thing. It's only when you have guilt uh, that yes. you've done something wrong. So in the danger zone, it is very hard to inhibit those cues. So I teach them because I want people to be able to spot them. Okay. What are those cues? Okay. So there's uh, a bunch and I'll, I'll let's talk about as many sure. as we can. So and this might be someone who's very successful, someone who's accomplished a lot potentially, someone that seems very credible. Yeah. Someone that could be in a power position, owning yes. a business or having influence online or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extremely successful. They could be successful. They could yeah. seem credible, trustworthy. Yes. But might be super narcissistic underneath. Yes. So there's a couple danger zone cues that we can control, which a manipulative person could inhibit, right? So for example, one that I found that I talk about in the book is Lance Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So Lance Armstrong, for those who don't know, spoiler alert, uh, Lance Armstrong was doping. So if you haven't, yeah. someone was like, there was spoilers in the book. And right, I was like, right. you haven't heard of that news <laughs> yeah, yeah. yet? Oh, I also talk about Britney Spears in the book because uh, there's some really interesting cues on her, which I think why we're worried about her, why her fans worry. She, she shows a lot of danger zone cues. Yes. So Lance Armstrong, in one of his early interviews on Larry King Live, he's asked about doping. And he does what's called a lip purse. So a lip purse is, okay, when we push our, line, our lips into a flat line, we mash our lips together. That is a universal withholding gesture. Mm -hmm. So when we're literally trying to hold something in or hold something back or we don't like what's being said or heard, we go... And so you'll notice that when someone has been asked something they don't like, when someone had to lie a lot of the time. So we did a massive experiment in our lab where we asked people to send in videos of themselves lying. Actually, you play it in the book. It's called Lie to Me. So I have you lie to me. Uh, play this lie to me game to diagnose your own tells. It's very important to know your own tells because you should know what your danger zone cues are when you're wow. leaking them. And one of the, <laughs> you should know those. It's good to know those in the back of your wow. pocket. Um, do that with your partner, right? You, don't, you want, yeah, you want yeah. them to know what those are too. Um, so one thing that we noticed is on lies. That was one of the biggest indicators. So in Lie to Me Game, we ask you to do two things. We ask you to tell us uh, an embarrassing story, your most embarrassing story, and then a fake embarrassing story. Mm -hmm. And we want to see if we can tell the difference. If we if we cut the clips, can we know which one is the fake one? Man, that'd be interesting. Yes. And it's amazing. You see the same danger zone cues over and over again, right before someone's about to lie and tell their fake embarrassing story. They go, okay. And they lip purse right before they're going to do it. And that's because we don't like lying. Mm -hmm. Our body knows it's going to get us into trouble. So we're like, stop it, stop it, stop it. And we hold ourselves back. You ask a woman, how much do you weigh? And she'll go, mm. Like literally close those mm. lips because no woman wants to talk about mm. how much she weighs. So it's a withholding gesture. And so um, that's the first thing is you want to look for some of the bigger cues, withholding gestures. Uh, lip purse is one. Uh, a sudden distancing behavior. So we also noticed that liars in our lab, they wanted to like get away from the lie, like as if it smelled. Mm -hmm. So like when they were telling their most embarrassing story, they'd be like leaning in, using gestures. Oh, it was so embarrassing. And remember, Embarrassing stories are negative. Right. <laughs> so it's not like it's a positive memory. Right. It's like people are like, and they do a shame touch. The universal shame touch is when people uh, touch their fingers to the side of yes, their forehead. This happened in a mile. Oh, gosh, I'm so embarrassed. So they usually tell the truth and they do like this. Yes, because they're actually embarrassed, right? So these are all good, like congruent. Right? We're seeing mm -hmm. embarrassment and shame gesture. We're seeing negative nonverbal and people shaking their head. I can't believe that happened. Right? Like they, oh, they're so upset that happened. We're seeing cringes. We're seeing fear. We're seeing sadness. Congruent. Right? Like that's all congruent emotion. Mm. On the bad stories, we often see people will lip purse and then they try to get away from it. So they'll say a statement and then, uh, you know, and then, um, <laughs> and they're literally like as far away, I hope I'm not messing up my audio there, as yeah, yeah. far away from the lie as they can possibly get. They're leaning back, they'll sometimes literally lean their head back in the chair, and that's because physically we want to distance ourselves from things we don't like. Uh -huh. So we're looking for lip purses, sudden distancing. And there's a lot of cues that we can't control. 
right? So blink rate is another one. Eye blocking behavior is um, liars have higher blink rates. They blink more. Yeah, actually in uh, Britney Spears, she had a really interesting interview that I, um, I actually break this down on my YouTube channel, so you don't even have to read the book if you wanna see it, where I break down the cues in this early interview. This is right before the conservatorship started. So very, very full of cues because it's right before it happened. And she gets asked, very difficult question. And she, all of a sudden, her blink rate goes from a normal rate to a high rate. So she starts to to really quickly blink her eyes like this. And that is because when we're really nervous, we literally want to close out stimuli to not see what's happening so we can process what's happening. So blink wow. rate is something that a lot of manipulative people cannot control. In fact, when I share this, people go, oh, I know a very narcissistic manipulative person who has a very high blink rate. Interesting. Because they're literally like trying to block out the lie or the manipulation. And so they'll sound really good, but they're like really like processing a lot. And, you, and you're like, why are they blinking so much? And it's because they're trying to process. Oh my goodness. So just knowing those cues are not all bad on their own, but it's, just, it's important to know what those cues look like so you can spot them. And I do think, I really think, Manipulative people will get caught eventually. Mm -hmm. It is very hard to fake competence. Mm -hmm. It is very hard to fake warmth. It's hard to keep that yes. up. And so for the long game, yes, you can learn a couple of these cues mm -hmm. and try to master your way around them. But for the long game, it's really hard. I mean, look at, yeah. you know, Theranos, right? So um, uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Mm -hmm. So spoiler alert, Theranos did not go well. <laughs> I feel like I always have to say that. <laughs> So one of her interesting cues is, um, I don't know if you've ever seen her talk. She has a really, she uses a really deep voice, like fakely deep, like down here. Uh -huh. And people used to say like, is that real? It's because she read in some cue book, it wasn't mine because my book wasn't out then, thank goodness. She read in some book that having a lower tone of voice makes you more competent. And that is true. Mm. Research has found that people who use the lower end of their natural voice tone are seen as competent. That's for both men and women. So you have a very deep voice and it serves you really well. Mm. When I'm talking right now, I'm trying to use the lowest end of my natural register. When I'm talking no, to my this. toddler, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. When I'm talking to my toddler, I'm much more up here. You know, hey baby, how are you? Mm. But if I were to do my entire interview like this, it would drive you crazy. <laughs> right, right. right. You wouldn't so, feel competent. No, and it wouldn't, and people would go, I, ugh, I can't, I'm not taking her or take her seriously. So she read that study, mm. obviously. And went an octave lower. Uh, there you go. And went an octave lower. So it wasn't her natural voice tone. It was like one step lower than her voice tone. So she was always talking like this. And when she did an interview, she would talk like this. And you would hear that this just doesn't sound natural. And part of your spidey sense would be like, why is she talking so low? It sounds really unnatural. And it came out that when she was drunk, her employees noticed that she went back into her natural register. Wow. So... There are cues that they will eventually Don't break. drink alcohol. No, <laughs> and that is the point of this story. Don't drink alcohol. Or you're going to get caught. <laughs> yeah. So like you can't keep it up for that long. Right. It is that she was faking that cue, we think. I think you're also just, your body is out of integrity. Like the mm. more you're, you're keeping back something, you're telling a slight lie or whatever. I mean, I felt this from the past because I've been out of integrity in my life at different times from different stages of childhood to adulthood, right? From little white lies to bigger they stuff hiding bad. from my parents or whatever Ooh, it is. they feel bad. So you're like, oh, like something inside of you feels off, right? Yes. And then you got to like keep the lie up and you're like, uh, eventually you're going to explode or you're going to have a heart attack or it's gonna something. Leak. Yeah, it's it's going to leak. It's going to leak. Like Leaky cues. Is that leak, you leak those cues and like those are the cues that we're looking for. Like I want you to yeah. be on the lookout for them because when something feels bad, like even like something feels bad, even just then when you were saying it felt bad, it, your voice tone changed. Right. Just then. Yeah. Because when you think about, oh, I'm, I like think about seeing a toxic person and I know that people probably have toxic people in their lives and this is why toxic people are so challenging because toxic people put us out of integrity. Toxic people force us to use warm cues where we don't feel like it. Mm. Now we can do, do you, it. What do you mean? We gotta be nice to them or something? Yeah, so like if you have a toxic person and this is the thorn and and I think our work is I want everyone to be their best selves. I want them to show up as their warmest, most competent self. But what if you have a toxic person? How do you do that authentically? Mm -hmm. And this is what's so hard about toxic people. Mm. You have a colleague or a coworker or a family member yeah. that you don't like, right? And you have to break out the fake warmth cues. Oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> right. right? And so what do we do? We fake smile, right? So, oh, it's so good to see you. Mm. Right? Yeah, it and doesn't like, look, no, it doesn't look like it, right? Yeah, yeah. Or we say, oh, yeah, so how, oh, that sounds good. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> now your LA roots are coming back right? to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that, right. That's why toxic people challenge us is because they come into our lives. We know we're supposed to be warm. And so we try to force that warm sound and it comes out sort of forced and then it makes us feel bad and then we're trying to overcompensate for it. And so you know what the antidote here is not learning more fake warmth cues. It's it's time to get rid of toxic people. Mm. I think that's like the side effect right. of the book is like... Don't keep them around. Don't yeah. keep those people around because... Mm-hmm. It will leak. And so set boundaries around So what, what around do you mean them. it will leak? Like your integrity will leak because you're constantly trying to be nice, but you're actually out of integrity because you don't want to be. Right. Is that right? Right. That's exactly so right. So your body is like, I'm doing something that's not authentic to me because I feel like I have to with this person. That's right. And the more frequently you do that, you feel out of integrity with yourself. Yep. Exactly. With so yourself? With, your, <laughs> with yourself. So with yourself. That was a question you were asking me. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. That was perfect because you were asking a question. I knew, yes, is if you allow toxic people to come into your life, especially without boundaries, we have to have oh, some yeah. of those people we deal with. Yeah, but of if, if you don't have boundaries around them, they come into your life and you have to fake niceness. Lying. Yes. And how you can tell someone's lying. Yes. Oh, God. So I. When you don't have much up, of this in the book. I right? don't. Yeah. I don't have very much of this in the book. Why don't you have this in the book? The reason is because. I think this is one of those evil superpowers. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like, ma-ha-ha. It's like that. Yeah. Because it is very powerful. The science behind lie detection is is very concrete. Mm. It's not a guessing game. We do know a lot about what, peop- what happens to people when they lie. The problem is, is amateur lie detectors do worse than people who don't know anything about lying. Ah. Got it. That, so my, my always my worry is like, oh my gosh, if I give someone a little bit of information, I actually make them worse. So for example, in the biggest study on lie detection that was done, we can spot lies with 54% accuracy. So flip a coin? Exactly. Yeah. It's terrible. Like we're terrible. And by the way, like police officers don't, oh, so can you guess there's one group that did better on this? It's not police officers. It's not doctors. It's not teachers. Kids. No, I, I wish it was kids. They actually didn't test kids because that's a whole uh, different IRB process. Who could test? Who who was more efficient and see if there's a lie? It Someone was. was lying. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. The group, um, prison inmates. Wow, that makes sense. Right. As, as soon as I read that, I was like, oh yeah. And they, and they they joked like the title of that section is like it takes one to know one. Oh yeah, of course. Right. And so that was like very you interesting BS to me. BS or, Exa- know, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So can't steal from a thief, you know, (laughs) all those things. Yes, exactly. The same thing happens with lying. So the problem is, is that the moment you give an amateur, like liar, like someone uh, amateur tips, their ability goes below 55%. It gets even worse. They don't know. Yeah. Because it's like you need the whole system. But I think there's a couple of things that if you Mm. are interested in this thing or in this idea, this topic, there's a couple of things that you want to start with. And there are things that can immediately help you spot lies in your life. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. The first thing that you want to look for are incongruencies. So in interactions, it's very easy to control our words, right? Anyone can say anything. What you're looking for is incongruencies with the body or voice tone. So for example, if I were to show up and be like, I'm so happy to be here today, right? right? Like you can hear it. Um, Our body language has 12.5 times more weight than our words. So with liars, what you're looking for is leaks, Leaks or incongruencies. A very common one is in Western cultures, an up and down nod, a vertical nod uh-huh. means yes, and a horizontal one means no. Right. So an incongruency would be... So like yes. Right. Exactly. Or like, um, and for people who are listening, I'm shaking my head opposite. Yeah. yeah. So it would be, um, so did you uh, take the cookies from the cookie jar? Um, no. Right, right. Shaking their <laughs> yeah, head yeah, yes, yeah. right? Yeah. So that, that's like a leak. That's something that we often mm-hmm. see where we're seeing some kind of incongruency. The other big kind of incongruency is um, microexpressions. And this is something that I do talk about in the book. It's sort of the first step to lie detection, is learning how to read faces. Yeah. And the most important facial expression to recognize, this is the most powerful one, is the expression of contempt. So contempt is a one-sided mouth raise. Mm. Smirk. Dr. John Gottman, he analyzed thousands of couples in his love lab looking for patterns in marriages, he found that couples who showed contempt towards the other with 93% accuracy would get divorced within 30 years. I mean, you don't, you don't hear stats like that very often. Wow. So contempt is a really interesting one. You see it a lot on liars because if someone is truly happy about something or very excited to see you or happy to be there, there's no reason they're going to show contempt with a smirk. It often will come out either because they're actually not happy with what they're saying or they hate having to lie. Mm. Liars hate lying. So 
oftentimes, and we um, have a, we did a big lie detection experiment. We had people play two truths and a lie with us, and we analyzed oh, their wow. videos. Oh yes, it was. <laughs> <it's a, laughs> Want to play, Lewis? No, <laughs> um, yeah, so like they, we actually analyzed their cues. Liars hate to lie. We don't like the feeling in our body when we lie. It feels no. really inauthentic. So sometimes you'll see a liar who will make contempt because they're like, "Oh, I really don't want to have to do this," and they hold their mouth in that side contempt expression because they really don't like it. So the two things that I want you to look out for, and if if you're starting to see it, that means you actually have an eye for it, is contempt when there shouldn't be contempt and any kind of incongruencies like that negative head Mm -hmm. head nod or when someone says something but doesn't actually mean it. Though you start with those two steps and you're already going to increase your abilities. Your lie detection capabilities. Yes. I like it. I like it. But you use your gut. You use your intuition intuition. for lie detection. You feel it, you know. Like you're reading everything, just kind of like you reading the guy like sweating and you're yes. smelling it and you're like, yes, everything combined. Exactly. So yeah. actually that is more important. That's the most important. And eye contact intuition. as well. You know, if someone's like not looking at you and they're, you know. So liars, tip, if you're lying face to face, not on video. <clears throat> so liars typically look you in the eye more because they want to see if you believe them. Oh, uh, want to see if you believe them? No yes. way. Yes. Why don't you want to like try to do that so you could try to like just act like you're telling the truth? So, either one. So, yeah. really good liars actually make more eye contact. Like, I don't believe. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, like for example, like a really good liar is like, I'm going to deliver this to you right. and hope you. Del-. And they're trying to see, does this? Do they believe me? Are they making any weird facial expressions? Can I convince them? So, actually, looking away, shifty eyes is just a sign of nervousness. Oh yeah. A, a truth teller can be nervous too. So there's all these weird myths. Also, mm, um, yeah. you want to guess the um, mode of communication that has the highest amount of lies. So your choices are face to face, emails. I am or chat, like text. Which do you think has the most amount of lies? Uh, text? Is that the it least is, amount? Nope. It is phone has the most amount of lies. And the reason for this is because... Oh, I think I know why. Tell me. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I, just, I bet you, I I bet you have it right. Well, because one... Well, I don't know. I was going to say anything that's not recorded. Ah, yeah, yes. That's it. But that's text the is like you got the proof or something. You can go back to it. That's exactly right, though. That's why. So phone has the most because there's no paper trail. Yes. And you don't have to lie to someone's face. Right? <laughs> like it's, it's real easy yeah. to like turn your back and be like, like I'm no. going to. Yeah. yeah. So um, whereas email, text, and face-to-face, yeah. email, text has a paper trail and face-to-face doesn't. So there's all these really interesting things about lying that we have misconceptions or mm-hmm. we don't think about them. So by the way, if you're doing a lot of business on the phone, if you're doing a lot of coaching on the phone. Wow. You really have to be careful. Um, all, I have a lot of students who are life coaches. They work with a lot of students, and they do a lot of phone consulting. What the problem with that is, is if it has the most amount of lies or we're talking about hidden emotions, and if you're working as a coach, like you really have to spot those hidden emotions. You have to think about what are ways that we can either bring the video to this, like do video chat or do in person, mm-hmm. or at least say, hey, I'm taking notes on this call. I'm going to send you a summary after we hang up. That actually brings the amount of lies down to email level because you're telling them I'm going to commit this to black and white. Yes. I'm going to commit this to paper. Yeah, so they feel like it's trustworthy. Exactly. So whenever I do negotiations, I do a lot of phone negotiations when I'm doing corporate events, I always say, uh, my assistant's on the line, so third person, right, to hear. Who's taking notes. Exactly. And- my assistant's on the line. She's going to be taking some notes for us. And don't worry, she'll send a full summary out afterwards. Please confirm that we got all the details right when you get it. Amazing. I have caught so many little lies. <laughs> People don't mean, I don't think. Take the notes. Yeah, yeah, because my assistant will take notes, very good notes. And then we always send it back and we say, please review these notes and please send us receipt that they all look good to you, that we got everything right. And what do people say? Well, the lies that we've caught is they've overestimated Mm -hmm. amount of people, overestimated a budget. They're not the actual decision maker. And so when we reply back with that email, they have to say, hmm. You know, I'm so sorry. I mentioned 5,000, but I actually think it's going to be a little bit closer to 3,000. Right. Right, because they know that we'll have it in writing if anything yeah, yeah. is changed. Of course. So protect yourself in the business world mm. by adding that in there. Uh, I think that's a really important strategy for just mm. getting more honest interactions. Mm. What about negotiations? Mm. Yes. Um, so for negotiations, um, the biggest thing here is actually vocal power. So going really? back to vocal, yes, because because we sue doctors based on our perception of their skills. The same thing happens in negotiations. Wow. We value people on our perceptions of their skills. So I know- Perception of their skills. Our perception of their skills. So when that comes through vocality. Yes, because when you go to a negotiation, you're not thinking about vocal. You're thinking about what are my 
assets? What are my value points? What are all the things I'm going to do? And those are all the important. But the very first impression, especially how you ask your number, is the most important thing. So for example, if you are quoting a price, and this is the hardest part of negotiation. Someone says, how much do you charge? Mm-hmm. What, what do you cost? And you say, um, question inflection. I charge $10,000. Yeah, it's not good. You are begging them to negotiate with you. Uh-huh. You're basically telling them, I'm not sure of this number, and you shouldn't be either. So first is making sure that you are saying, not asking. So make sure that you're going the downward inflection. So the question inflection is when you go up at the end of your sentences. That's very, very- Saying, not asking. Yes, versus going down at the end of your sentences. So when you have a number, you have a skill that you're going to share, think about the verbal ahead of time. But with vocal, you want to deliver that in an authoritative voice tone. So for example, like President Obama was so if very said, good at So how would you say $10,000? Ah, right? so, so here's the bad way first. I always like to do negative practice first. So <clears throat> bad way is um, it'll be, um, I'd, I'd love to work with you. I think we'd be a great partnership and it will be $5,000. That's the bad way. The good way is I'd love to work with you. I think we'd be a great partner and the cost will be $5,000. Right, yeah. so it's just adding Going it at the end. Bit, yeah. It's 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 a finality, right? It's like saying like this is my cost, and I know how much I'm worth mm-hmm. now. If you don't know how much you're worth, we can have a different discussion about sure, that, sure. right? Like I want you to own your worth. You are mm-hmm. your your time is valuable. Your skills are valuable. You spent years learning to do what you do, mm-hmm. so you have to be able to price that. Well. Your worth is only worth what someone's willing to pay, as well. One hundred percent. So if you can't convince or enroll exactly. someone, or you know. And then back it up with results, then, you know, you may get it, but you may not keep it. So you've got to like do right. a lumber. And things. they don't have a perception of your value that exactly. way. So the first thing is the is the downward inflection. The second thing is volume. Mm-hmm. So when we're really nervous, we will lose volume. Remember how we're excited? Softer. I go up. Yeah. So salespeople, I do a lot of sales trainings. They'll do this thing where on the point they're most nervous about, like their weak point or something they're lying about or a bad uh-huh. number. Oh, yeah, we'd love to work with you. I think it'll be really great. And um cost will be $5,000. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's a social signal of, ah, this person doesn't really want to charge that. Yeah. I'm going to ask for less. I think it's when you're like calm and uh, comfortable mm-hmm. when you speak about it, that's going to come across well, right? And practicing saying your hardest points. So go through that practice sheet, you know, the, the notes you take before a meeting mm-hmm. and practice saying to another human being, you're not your mirror. Here's my rate. Yeah. Here is my rate. Or, um, there's other things you can be nervous yeah. about too in a negotiation, right? Like a timeline yes. or a skill level or maybe uh, other competitors who you mm-hmm. think might be able to beat you. Make sure that you are practicing those comments with so, authoritative voice tone and solid volume. So people feel comfortable and confident in, in and your And they work. catch it. Yeah. And you infect mm-hmm. that feeling. I love like <clears> – for me, it's so easy. I get a lot of email inbound email requests mm-hmm. for speaking. Yeah. And I never want to jump on the phone with anyone because I'm just I like, know. it's exhausting, you know, problem. like having these conversations. So people will say, we'd love to book you. And I literally reply with like one sentence. I'm like, I'm $35,000. Mm-hmm. Just let me know the dates yeah. and I'll see if I'm free. Yeah. That's about all I say. Yes. Sometimes I'll ask like, tell me more about like what it is. But you know, it's yes. usually just like, here it is. If and I'm free, let me, I'll let you know, but tell me the dates. And typically, someone who is emailing you should already know that you're going to have a high value. Right. And if you're, that's also part of your brand, right? Like you're very direct. Uh-huh. If people want to know about what you, you have a podcast they can listen yeah, to. Exactly. You have a book that they can yeah. read. Yeah. And so it's also about how do you position your numbers. Mm-hmm. So yes, you can give a lot of information, right? You can, and there's different kinds of proof. There's yep. three different kinds of proof. There's social proof. So that would be, um, you know, we've had 15 events in the last six months or whatever. There's um, qualitative testimonial proof. So mm-hmm. this is like a CR person or a salesperson says, Lewis was the best speaker I yeah. ever had. Yep. And there's credibility proof. So media mentions, published book, yeah. bestselling author. So you have to think about, now, Lewis, you have those. You have all yeah. three of them because you have a book that's on your website. You have social proof. You have podcasts. So you don't need to necessarily go and prove that. No. However, if you don't have a website or if you don't have those obvious buckets filled, you need to make sure that you are hitting all three of those proof buckets in your response. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have a book or a podcast or anything like that, your email back should be, so great to hear from you. First mention of social proof. I've done events for groups like yours in the past. They've yeah. done really well. I think we did three different groups last year. Yeah. Social proof number one. Second, attached to this email, I have a deck with an overview of topics as well as some testimonials from some of our previous groups that have really right. enjoyed us. And then um, here are my rates. Please let me know dates. 
And then at the bottom, any professional credibility mentions. So are you certified? Mm -hmm. Are you a doctor? Yeah. Have you been on any media? Those can be at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. That way you're very subtly hitting those three um, proof buckets. Yeah. And they're very important in negotiation. I love it. I love it. Um, is there anything that you want to share that we haven't shared? Oh, my gosh. I would say that the, the, the last thing, and this is something that I tried to make a big point in the book, I don't want to hit people over the head with it, but I don't think I got it as, as well mm -hmm. as I wanted, which is I don't think you should ever pretend to be something you're not. Again, I don't believe in fake it till you make it. I think that you're better off spending your time instead of trying to be the bubbly extrovert is trying to find out what is your unique brand of charisma. Like what is your flavor? I think that the more time you can spend on that before trying to emulate mm -hmm. someone else or trying to dial up something that isn't natural to you is a much better place to be. And that's where happiness comes from. I think that's where what that's what people mean when they say authentic. And so anything I've said today in this interview or anything that you've read, try to figure out what's your unique take on that. Like make, go prove, go make me prove my worth, right? Like if I if I said something that sounded interesting to you, go make an experiment, right? Like go yeah. up to fifty different people in the next fifty days, yes, and see if you can try out a conversation sparker if that works for you. Mm -hmm. If you can find your unique flavor, if you can treat it like an experiment, you can never fail because yeah. experiments never fail. Yeah, that's good. I, I did an experiment when I moved to New York City as well because I was like, I want to I meet some new people. I don't know anyone here. Yeah. And I call it the Red Rose Project. What? Can you guess what it was? Did you give red roses to people? <laughs> I did. Yes. Every day I bought roses and I would give them out. <laughs> yes. This is what I was single. I gave them out to girls. Yes. <laughs> and Wait, were you only trying to meet girls? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you were about to say no. I'm not going to no. lie. I'm not going to lie. Like you were about to I'm say not going to lie. Don't lie. You can't no, lie. I was trying to meet guys too, but this specific project was <laughs> okay, for okay, like dating girls. Got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take girls on a date. And I, uh, <laughs> it only lasted like four days because I like met a few different people and it worked. Yeah, it worked. But a, a, a couple of times it didn't work. What happened? I thought I was like Did so girl, smooth. Like, throw to, like hit you I with the I thought I was like, you know, I'm a nice guy. Like. <laughs> I'm disarming. You know, I wasn't like this weird, like douchey dude or whatever. I thought I was well, like a nice with the guy. Roses is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, but I remember I went up to like one girl, uh -oh. and she like ran from me, and I was no. like, "Oh my, god. oh my god!" I was like, "Okay, this did not work." But she was also kind of like a little moody and like yeah, I don't know. Anyways, but most people they were like, "Oh, thank you." They were kind of taken back. They thought I was mm -hmm. gonna, add, and I didn't you ask just, for anything you either. Just gave it I just to them. Gave it to them. Yes. And, let and it I would go. see what would happen. Yeah. And what happened? I would just like smile and just say, I wanted to give you a rose today. And I would like walk away. And did you, and did you meet people? Did you meet girls? I did. I, did. I met a few people. Uh, <gasps> yeah. But it only lasted for like a few days. And then I was like, oh. So here's a challenge to everyone yeah. listening. I like love that. Is there a project you can do for five days? Yeah. I, okay, so for, for my introverts listening, for my lovely introverts, mm -hmm. maybe for you it's something small. Maybe it's as small as um, texting a good friend a uh, conversation starter that you heard today. Right, like just with your good friends, yes. right? Deepening a relationship you already have. Maybe if you're a little more ambiverted, it's um, asking a new colleague to lunch mm -hmm. or asking a friend to lunch you haven't been to lunch with. Mm -hmm. And if for my extroverts, maybe it's the Lewis challenge, which yeah, is right. go buy roses or go buy lavender. I actually did this in the streets of New York with my lavender. Uh, I, yeah, we did. We did little bouquets of oh, lavender for everyone. That's cute. Um, and just told them to have a great day. Maybe it's something like that, like buying lavender, uh -huh. buying a rose, see what happens. and just see what happens. See what it's like when you get butterflies in your stomach and you have to approach someone. Take a five-day challenge from today because I think that we can hear all this stuff as knowledge. We can keep it in the back of our head and it makes us feel mm -hmm. good. But turning it into action is how we actually yes. have behavior change. Yes. Let's just say there's a person you don't like. Yeah. Let's just say it. Maybe they're not With, toxic. There's someone you don't like and totally. you don't like being nice too because you feel like, yeah. why am I – I just don't – nothing wrong not with them. There's not my person. Yeah. Totally. But let's say you're in a work environment. Yeah. And you're at a company, you got 50, 100 employees that you're working with, you're on a team with, and you're just, okay, I'm here. Yeah. Is it better to be inauthentic and lie and, mm. and act nice around this person? Mm. Friendly, fake, how are you, interested, mm -hmm. even though you've like been around them for six months or a year and you realize you really don't like them. Mm -hmm. Or is it better to go right up to the person after six months and say, you know what, I just want to be completely honest mm. and not fake with you because mm -hmm. I feel like I've been fake. Mm -hmm. That I don't connect with you, I don't like you. <laughs> I think I think you're out of integrity. I think you're inauthentic, uh -huh. and maybe I'm being judgmental. But I'd rather be honest with you and fake nice to you. Okay, that's A and B. Can I give a C? Sure. Okay, <clears throat> so I don't believe in fake it till you make it. So I uh -huh. I I try not to give like fake it. I don't I don't roll that way. Like I just think it's exhausting. I think it's gonna leak. The C option here is to not fake warmth. 
but is to double down on competence. So if you are working with someone that you don't like, the one thing that you do have to do is get stuff done with them, Mm -hmm. right? You have to master your tasks, you have to be on it, you have to be responsive to emails. So that is something that you can be authentic about because to do your job, you have to be able to get along with them in a very professional setting. So I would skip all the fake warmth stuff. Don't, go right don't, into competence. Yeah. Right? Like, sk- stick with where you're authentic, which mm-hmm. is like, I don't need to hear about your weekend. Mm-hmm. I don't need to go to happy hour with you. Right, right. Um, I don't need a fake sitting with you for coffee. Right. But you know what? We can get stuff done. You know what? So we create, align on so goals. So create boundaries around the, hey, let's go have coffee. Uh, Actually, you know, no, I'm, I'm busy. so busy. Yeah. I'm so busy today. But yeah. you know what? Let's do a brainstorm session tomorrow uh, at the end of the day so we can on really kick off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So get back to, like, the mission Competence. on the task on hand, the competence. And maybe you've just got to be like, okay, this is someone where, you know, 20 seconds a day, I've got to be around someone that's trying to be fake, la di da with everyone, yeah. and I'll just wait I'm going to get them, stuff done. And then I'll move on to the next That's thing. it. Gotcha. Exactly. Because at least you're focusing on where you can be authentic. Mm-hmm. And also that's, even if that were to come up, you could honestly say that kind of conversation could be, listen, like, you know, I'm... I, I'm not really into like, you know, connecting at work. I'm more about yeah. getting it done. I, I, I want to get home to my kids and my family. I hope that's okay with you. You know, when we're together, if it's all right, I might skip lunch and just have us like, you know, work it out and be really efficient. Yeah, that's good. I really appreciate how efficient you are because it allows me to get home to my kids faster. Mm. Right? Like that's authentic. So mm. what can you appreciate about them that's competent? Yes. What can you highlight about them that's competent? And that's what a weird way to work. What if you don't feel like they're warm or competent? You're like... This person on a team is just, they, they can't get anything done, they're not smart, and they have fake attitude around me all day. I mean, this depends on how you feel, but I would say deal with it. Mm. Like, you got, like, go to your boss. Right, and say, hey, I just, like, look, can you I put cannot... me on a different team? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You say, like, I don't know how I can work with this person. I don't want to be unauthentic, but I'm telling you that we're not getting stuff done, and they are causing issues on the team. Like, I don't like to ignore that stuff. Like, you could hope it gets better, but... Ask for help. If you have someone on your team or someone in your life who is not warm nor competent and doesn't treat you with warmth or competence, mm-hmm. either get them out of your life, set a boundary, or get help. Give them like don't live with plan it. or something. Yeah, yeah don't live with it. Life is too short to feel fakely competent or fake warmth. Right. What's been the, uh, I think I asked you this last time, what's been oh. the charisma strategy? Yeah. If you want to call it strategy. <laughs> you weren't what? sure about that. You weren't sure. About <laughs> I don't know that. what the word is right, but what is the charisma yeah. or social cue that you've yeah. learned in the last six months that has brought some new attention to your life where you said, ah, oh, I wasn't aware of that fully, but now the research is showing that when someone does mm. this, mm. it improves this. There's a new cue that I snuck into the book in the very last draft because okay. I just learned it. And this is actually brought to me by one of, a couple of my male readers. And I'm so curious. Okay. Do you agree with this, Lewis? Okay, here's what they said. So in the book, I had a whole section on nodding. So nodding, affirmative (laughs) nods, upside down, (laughs) right? I I nod all the time. Yes, yes, you're a nodder. It's really high warmth. We love it. We love nodding. Yes, nodding is great. Because vertical nods, and by the way, this is different in certain cultures where they'll nod. They nod um, sideways. Sideways, sideways. that's different. Okay, so just vertical nodding in Western cultures is agreement. It's yes. In fact, research has found that when you nod at me slowly, I speak three to four times longer. Ah, uh-huh. that's cool. That's why you're a good interviewer is because you'll nod and be like, keep going, yeah. keep going, keep I'm going. Just kind of, I'm just like a bobblehead. I'm just kind of like, yeah, this is good. Like a very slow, like, I'll pause slow. and be like, okay, cool. Okay, well, actually you're right. Slow nodding is tell me more. Fast uh-huh. nodding is finish up. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, I got it. Yeah. I got it, right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Okay, so that's the difference there. If you want someone to wrap up in a meeting, give them a one, two, three mm-hmm. triple nod. Like, mm-hmm. I got it. Mm-hmm. If you want them to keep going, mm-hmm. an introvert, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, funny. so that's the difference. That's number one. So I, I shared about this. I taught it. And then a couple of my male readers said to me, you know, Vanessa, we think that there is a secret nonverbal cue between guys. No, I don't know what this cue is. Here's what they said. Okay. <laughs> if you know a guy and you're trying to acknowledge him guy to guy, uh-huh. you nod up. Yeah. Good to see you. It's literally okay. like an open gesture. You're Sorry, open. Amen. If you don't know a guy, but you're trying to acknowledge his presence, you, hey, yeah. Good to see you. Oh, wow. That's so true. Is it true? That's so true. Yeah. It's like, oh, good to see you. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Acknowledged. Good yes. to see you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for, hey, what's up, buddy? Okay. Yeah, yeah so it's so this, true. Okay. So this was, so I snuck it into the book oh, last wow, that's minute. that's fascinating. I wonder, is that like biology? Is here's that why, Yes. Here's why I think. Like, okay. Here's my, here's my theory on this. I, as soon as I heard this, I was like, and I started looking. I started watching men. I asked my husband. I asked my guy friends. And this is why I think it happens. When we know someone, we expose our jugular. So this is a very vulnerable part of our body. And we're saying, I know you, I trust you. Look, I'm opening, I'm acknowledging you and yes. I feel trustworthy. Yes. When you don't know someone, but you want to show respect, 
You nod down to protect your dog. You're like, I don't know you, but I see you. I got you. I got you. So, I hear, I'm here for you, kind of. Yeah, you can't but, see my jugular, <laughs> but I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm going to protect myself, <laughs> but, I but see I'm you. here for you, bro. What's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's, that's where it comes from. Is that it's like a, sense. do I know you or do I not know you? So in that sense, that sense, this is a high warmth cue. Hey, buddy, what's up? Right, it's high warmth. You're showing your jugular. This mm -hmm. is a high confidence cue. Hello. Good to see you. I look ridiculous, yeah. but I don't do that. Right, I'm like, hi, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that, that that was a that was so surprising That's to me because there's so much more I think to be done. Like I list 96 cues in the book, right? There are that's just the start. I think I'm we're discovering more and more. I think that's where like the excitement comes in. So that was the new one. That's so cool. And what about what are the three most powerful cues, body language cues of leaders. Mm, okay. So this is the competence area of the spectrum, right? So when we talk about charisma, we talk about warmth, competence, charisma, and danger. Okay. So three body languages of leaders. Um, the example that I give that I really like to teach from is the Nixon-Kennedy presidential debate. Okay. Have you ever heard of this historical debate? We were not around for yes. this debate, so I'd be shocked if you'd seen it. So we want to be in the high, uh, there you go. the high charisma. There you go. Yes. We, we want to be Sweet doing spot. those cues all the time. That's right. We want to be in the star. So right now we're, you're talking about competence. You just asked me about leaders. So leaders typically are high competence and they can go into warmth and they want to. A high competence and charisma. Right. Are, are there high competence and high warmth? Yes, yes exactly. Gotcha. Right. So highly competent cues. If you know that you're warm and you need to dial up competence to hit the sweet spot, these are some cues that will help you. Give and it to me. The, my favorite is from the Nixon president, Nixon Kennedy presidential debate. So this, have you heard about this debate before? It's kind of remind me. Okay, yes. <laughs> you're like actually yes, I watched yeah. it on the History Channel last night. Wasn't I mean maybe you mentioned this before, but isn't one of them was angry or something? I can't remember what happened, but I, yeah. I, so this is this is why I like this story is because it created a puzzle. And I like puzzles. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened. Uh, during this part in U.S. history, uh, Nixon and Kennedy were running for president, and about half the population watched the presidential debate on television, yeah. and about half the population listened to the debate on the radio. Everyone who watched the debate was sure that Kennedy won, and everyone who listened to the debate was sure that Nixon won. Wow. And it was the first time where there was a discrepancy between the winners, the perceived winners. Because one sounded competent, the other one looked warm. One sounded like a leader and one looked like a leader. Ooh, you match them together. That's the sweet spot. That's the star. Okay. That's the star. Exactly. So, so one sounded like a leader. So Nixon sounded like a leader. He had really good vocal power, but he looked like a loser. Mm -hmm. And I hate to use that word, but he himself said in his memoirs, he believes he lost that entire presidential election based on the first few seconds of that debate. First few seconds. He himself said that. What he what happened? Okay. So he was, all, he was kind of like the Shark Tank guy, trying to buy back competence he, and warmth at the same time. He gave time. away his competence in the first few seconds of the debate. So anyone who saw it went, oh, no, 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 no. This guy is not a winner. And this was before they even spoke. So in the first 30 seconds of the debate, neither of them speak. You see them on camera. And if you were watching, you saw, wow, Nixon looks so weak. And here's why. What most people don't know is that Nixon had just injured his knee mm -hmm. on the campaign trail mm -hmm. and he'd been in the hospital for the week. So he came in with a bandaged knee and a fever. Kennedy had been tanning. Yeah, he was, he like, was like a nice suit and everything. He was ready to go. And also a kind of funny thing is the debate was in black and white and um, Nixon's suit was too brown. It blended into the background. So mm -hmm. we, I talk about color psychology at the very end of the book, colors. And so that was an issue one that he didn't pop as much on the black and white. Okay. Yeah. So he shows up and he's sitting in what's called the runner's stance. The runner's stance is when someone, so you know runners before they win a race, they like go yeah. into the crunch position one leg back. We know this as a readiness position. Universally across cultures, if someone's about to run away from us, they will get into this position, right? Like they're literally about to run away. It's why sprinters start a race like yeah. that. Well, Nixon spent the first 30 seconds of the debate in that position. Because of his knee. Because of like, his knee. He was in pain. He was trying to like just. He was nursing it. Yeah. But it made it look like he was about to run out on us. That's from a, just a quick nonverbal perspective. The first impression was, where's he going? Even though people didn't consciously realize it, he looked not planted. And we don't like leaders who aren't going to stay with us. Mm -hmm. Whereas Kennedy, on the other hand, he had a, a really uh, nice, uh, relaxed cross. And he used what's called humility hands. Research calls it humility hands. Humility hands are when your hands are on your leg and they're resting. Humility, humble. humble. So he looked relaxed, calm, here to stay. You know, right. not tense I'm not at all. Rush. I'm, I'm, here. Not, I'm here. I'm here. I'm your leader. Right? Yeah. So he looked, quote unquote, presidential. So first, the runner stance. Second is, and this is in the first 
10 they seconds sitting. of the debate. They were, they were sitting. sitting. They were sitting next to each other. They weren't yes. on a podium. No. So here's your first snapshot of the debate. And you see Kennedy, very humility relax. hands, yes, relax. relax, sitting tall. And then you see Nixon, who's like <laughs> gripping yeah, the chair leave. arm, ready to leave. And we mm -hmm. see these cues and people already made their decision. But people mm -hmm. who were listening didn't see any of that. Right. They heard the voice. They heard the voice. Yeah. Interesting. And so Nixon lost the debate to Kennedy. He lost the election to Kennedy. And he said in his memoirs, that's why is because of the cues I sent. And so for leaders, here's what we want to think about. One is relaxed, here to stay. So the more you can settle into your place, the distance, this is such a weird measurement. I want to see the biggest distance between your earlobe and your shoulder. The so reason, not like this. Yes, yes. Or because why? When we are confident, when we are winners, we take up as much space as possible, mm -hmm. right? We broaden our shoulders, we tilt our head towards the That's sky. Right. Winners feel pride. So we look at the distance between someone's ear and shoulder and we're like, oh, he looks, she looks confident. When someone hops on a video call, this is the mistake I see. Hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. Shoulders pinched up towards ears. Oh, wow. And we wonder why people aren't taking us seriously. We wonder why people are interrupting us is because this distance, if I'm like this, Hey everyone, happy Monday. <laughs> well, your tonality as well, but yeah. <laughs> right? Like if I start a video call like this. So um, today we're gonna talk about some updates and I'm gonna go over some different <laughs> slides with you and we're gonna wait a few minutes while people log on. Oh my. <laughs> right? Like, so it, horrible. It, if I'm on your team, are they? Is everyone just like? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no one gets. You know, are you just yeah. calling each other out on your social? Everyone's cues? a winner on my team. They're yeah. amazing, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like we like we like play music. Yeah, like yeah. yeah, right. Of course, you can lean in sometimes. You can, but in that first impression, especially, right? right it's like, hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. So right. I want you to think about profile pictures, uh -huh. videos. I love chairs with armrests. Why? It helps our. Our shoulders stay grounded. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest one is taking up space. The second thing that happens that also gives you more vocal power. Mm. So if I were to do my this entire interview with my uh, shoulders up, it would look bizarre, <laughs> right? right? You, I would, would look scared. You would be more closed would, up. Yeah, it would be. And so if I tense my vocal cords right now, I'll begin to go into vocal fry. So mm. vocal fry, have you heard this before? Yes. It's when your voice sounds like sizzling bacon. I just don't know. I'm not <laughs> sure. But sure. like I was just thinking about it. And if it's, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we'll accidentally go into fry is because we're literally clenching our vocal cords and it, they cannot get enough breath. Vocal fry, not to be gross, but vocal fry happens when our vocal cords rattle together. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're hearing is the rattling. That's why we don't like it. And so when you have space, you prevent vocal fry. Okay. If you hear yourself in vocal fry, here's the quickest fix you have. Speak louder. Right. So the best way to get rid of vocal fry is to just up your volume. It will push more air through your vocal mm -hmm. cords and it makes them uh, hum. Yeah. If other people on your team are using vocal fry, just ask them to speak up. And speak a little louder. Yeah. yeah. That will usually get them out of vocal fry. Yeah. Okay. Little secret. Don't, don't blame it on me, but that's a really easy way to, if you're interviewing someone, and they're in vocal fry and you know it's going to drive your listeners crazy. Just like, you know, the audio, they just can't hear you. Can Could little, you speak yeah. a little bit louder? It will work. Now, what's the difference between the humble hands mm. on a knees mm -hmm. or on a table, I guess, right here? Does this work on a table as well? Yes, yes. Versus hand over top of the other hand, yes. which is relaxed but also is closed body. Yes. Versus two, okay. hands, two mm. hands side by side, relaxed, not like intense, but relaxed side by side. What's the difference between these two? Perfect question. So your book cover, your mm. book cover is hand over hand Yeah. and they're relaxed Yeah. and it's a closed posture, but it works, mm -hmm. right? And so it's okay to me, as long as your hands are relaxed, I don't care if they're closed or open. Now I do care about this. So when we protect our arms trunk, crossed. arms crossed, yes, I do care about this. And why is because when we are crossing like this, I know it's comfortable for some people. Mm -hmm. What research finds is two things. One is we look more closed off. So mm -hmm. we never want to look closed off. But second, they found that when people are trying to be creative or strategic, they literally cannot generate as, as much ideas when they are like this. What's the alternative? Humility hands, open posture, holding a drink, typing at a computer, taking notes. Anything else but Anything the <laughs> else but that. Anything else. So I love props. So I, the way that I don't cross my arms, because I actually like to cross my arms. Yeah. Um, it's kind of relaxing, you know, it's kind of like. Uh, I know. Yeah. But actually, if you're thinking or processing, cross away, right? If, you're, if you need to like take a minute, yeah. take a step back, it's a great way to break. So I hold a clicker for presentations and a pen, you know, like for slides. Because every time I think about crossing my arms, I remember, oh, I have the clicker.
Mm. When we think about getting rid of, I, I call them like bad nonverbal habits, right? So ticks, so ums, crossing arms, uh, those are all bad nonverbal habits. Slouching. Slouching, or, yeah. yeah. It's really hard to just say, don't do that. So what I'd rather you do is replace it. Mm-hmm. Displacement tactics. Okay, so you don't you don't you cross your arms. Can you hold a coffee mug? Can you hold a pen? Can you hold a clicker? Can you always have a moleskin notebook? I have a, a student of mine who always has a moleskin. He doesn't need it. <laughs> he just holds he, it. He yeah. has it. He opens it up and he'll write the date and the meeting name and what he had for breakfast. But that's it. He literally uses it because if he doesn't, he puts his hands in his pocket or crosses his arms. And so he has it in front of him because it helps him feel very grounded it's and centered. It's a replacement tool. It's a replacement tool. Yeah. So I would think about what are some tools you can use that will help you do that. What about like what about the uh, the finger crossing? So inter- like look at the difference. It's like this, when I'm white knuckling, you can see that I am tense. I'm trying to keep mm. it together, Vanessa. Mm. Right? Like But this is But relax. this, so this is called a steeple. The fingertip touch. Oh, I love a steeple. Yeah, so a steeple is when the tips of your fingers touch and like a church steeple. It's like Mr. Wonderful just does this the whole time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You will notice that when Mr. Yes, when Mr. Wonderful is trying contemplating a deal, he'll go like this. I'll Why? Doesn't it make you feel like you're just in control? Mm, it's yeah. like, hmm. Mm. And so this is a, a really good power gesture. It's in what's one of our competence cues. That's why I have it on the cover of the book, is to show high competence um, because it's about getting in control. The steeple, we love it because it shows our palms, which shows we're not concealing anything. Do you want the steeple pointed at someone? Either or one. Any up. of those, any and all, whatever feels natural. Up here like the diamond. I wouldn't do this. Yeah. I wouldn't be like, hello everyone, yeah, yeah. good morning. <laughs> so here or pointed out them is right, fine. Right, totally fine. You'll notice that like, Mr. Wonderful does it perfectly. He'll like go like this, he'll tap it. The only thing I would be careful of is drumming fingers. That looks like Mr. Burns mm. evil, right? Mm. <laughs> Schmeagle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I don't love that one, okay? So like, don't uh, look like you're scheming, right? Yeah. Like that can look a little bit crazy. <laughs> but if you're like, oh yes, I'm thinking about it. Now, I wanna give a caveat. Please only use cues that you've tried on a few times and feel natural. There are some cues in the book where there's 96 cues in the book that I still don't like. I've tried them every which way and I do not like them. What's the most powerful cue that you don't like but you know is extremely effective in charisma or connection or trust or leadership? volume. So research shows that people who speak in louder volumes literally are taken more seriously but that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Mm. And so even on stage, when I'm like really excited, I still don't want to be like, let me tell you about something very, oh God, that's horrible. Yeah. I don't like it. But volume dynamism is a cue I teach in the book that I have trouble with. But the research shows that people are more trustworthy or more competent. Competent. It is a competent cue. Because if you're soft, it's like you don't believe in your words. It's actually volume dynamism. So it's being able to use your volume to match your intention. So for example, so, let's... So tonality and fluctuation at the right we, moments. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So like, for example, I feel a little ridiculous when I do this. This is why, this is a cue that I struggle with, which is like, let me tell you about something mm-hmm. super important. Yeah. I just feel ridiculous. But some people do it so well. it works. Oh, it works so well. And some of their people are so charismatic. Yes. When you can get the tonality, the inflectuation, is that what it is, of the tonality. They taught this to us in Toastmasters as one of the 10 initial lessons of being a competent communicator. One of the exercises is to give a five minute speech using tonality. It's very, you have to like find the cues of when you like pause and slow and then you bring it up. It's like. (laughs) How do you make it authentic? Oh. And, yeah. So some people do it naturally. They're so good so at it. So gifted. That is not me. That is why I don't have a podcast. That's why I have a YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Like on YouTube, I can use my gestures and my uh-huh. facial expressions. It's why I don't have a podcast. I feel I am not mm. dynamic enough in my vocal power. And so that's one cue that I am I work on, but I have a hard time being in control of my volume. Yeah. Okay, so we have that, these hand gestures. Mm-hmm. This is fine on the table also? Yep, all good, relaxing good. What about hands open on the table? Okay, so let's talk about open palm body. up versus palm down. Yeah. Okay, so when I was reaching for the book, I was looking for my favorite are cues hiding in plain sight. Those are my favorite. I, oh, I just used it. Those are my favorite. Those are my favorite. Yeah, you did. That was very <laughs> I organic. I did. It's very natural. I'm really happy right now. It's like you're okay. speaking to a girlfriend, just naturally <laughs> just flowing t- through. Let me tell I'll you. Tell you Yeah, okay, so that was great. That was very exciting. I feel very excited. Okay, so I love cues hiding in plain sight. And so I had a lot of political examples, a lot of celebrity examples, and Brittany and Lance Armstrong, but I wanted historical examples. And so I was looking at famous paintings, and I noticed The Last Supper, painted by Leonardo da Vinci, has hidden cues in it. 
you'll notice that uh, the way that it's positioned, mm -hmm. Christ is positioned in the middle. So D Da Vinci positioned in the middle. Okay. Most people do not realize that in that picture, Christ is doing this. He has one palm up and one palm down. It's hard to see it in that. Oh, yeah. His shot. left palm is up. And yes. And the right palm is down on the table, right? Now, this is very interesting because, like, most people don't look at this right away. But why? Why is he doing that? Why would he put his hand like that? Why would he put his hand like that? And what do those mean? So let's look at the research. Palms open are universal gestures of openness. When we want something, what do we do? We hold open our hand. Give we're, it to me. Yeah. When we're offering something, what do we do? We hold open our hand. Mm -hmm. When we are open to suggestion, we show our palm and we have it visible. A palm down gesture is a high competence cue. It shows dominance. It shows directiveness. You might think of, I won't mention them by name, some famous dictators of the past mm -hmm. who did palm down gestures. Mm -hmm. Why? That is a very dominant gesture. When you are giving, people are giving directives, they often say, be quiet, sit down, mm. right? I don't want to hear from you right now. It's a very direct. Dismissive too, in a sense, right? It's kind Especially of like... if you shake it at someone. So why would we have these two cues? They perfectly balance each other out. Christ is depicted as the highest, most charismatic person in the painting. And so what does he do? He literally balances warmth and competence. He's showing the universal gesture of openness and mm -hmm. giving, while at the same time, a universal gesture of direct authority. When was this painting made? <laughs> 1498. Wow. Yeah. So da Vinci, I think, hid cues that signaled the viewer, wow, he's charismatic. But the takeaway from this, by the way, is if you're giving a directive and you don't want it to be questioned, you're better off giving palms down. Mm. You're better off saying, listen, team, we've got to get this done. We've got to be efficient. We've got to be streamlined. I need you to do it for me. Mm. Just go. Yeah. Just go. Just do it. If you want feedback, like when I take q and I'm like, what well, can I do? What questions can I answer? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm giving open. That's a very, very subtle but very powerful cue. Okay, so that's how... Christ is depicted balancing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that he does is if you measure the amount of space that Christ takes up in the painting, you'll notice he takes up the most space. He is literally has the most distance between his shoulder and yeah, his earlobe. Like yeah, like, yes, because he's tilting. So like, tilting is a warmth gesture. And so he's the only pictured person who is head tilt with also expansive posture. So there's all these hidden cues that I think paint this picture behind what's happening. Now, if you look at Judas... Now, if you didn't know anything about this history, Judas would be the character painted with the most intrigue. If you notice, he's also holding a clenched fist, right? He's the only character in the picture who has a clenched fist and is distancing. He's literally turning his body away from us. Mm -hmm. And we know, we already talked about, that distancing is a danger zone cue. So here is the person who is later about to betray Christ. And how does da Vinci signal that? He hides cues. He shows a clenched fist, which shows withholding and anger. And then he shows that he's about to lie, that he literally wow. turns his body away. Mm -hmm. The reason I show this is because I think that we don't realize there's these cues being sent to us all the time. Um, you know, I do a lot of breakdowns on my YouTube channel of politicians. And we don't realize, even when we look at political campaigns, in one picture, there's thousands of cues being sent to us. And the, we should know what's being sent to us. The thumb pinch. Oh, the thumb pinch. This is Obama, right? Okay. He did this all the time, didn't he? So here's what's funny is Obama used to be a pointer. We don't like being pointed at. So mm. there's something about it as humans. You know, it's like, let me tell you what to do. It's right. kind of a better than. <laughs> so I think he was coached because all of a sudden he never pointed again. And he only used the thumb pinch. Mm -hmm. The thumb pinch is a very clever gesture because in Western cultures, this means good job, thumbs up, thumbs up, good job, or like me. Like literally, social media, like, right? This is what we see. Like, 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 give me a like. And so the thumb pinch is a very subtle thumbs up gesture. So every time he does it, it makes you think, oh, first of all, it's not, he never clenches. It's relaxed. It's relaxed. It's kind of like an open thumb. It's an open thumb because he's saying, a-okay, a-okay, like, like, mm -hmm. like. And he's also saying, this is a point I want you to remember. Mm -hmm. It literally looks it's, like a bullet point. Right, right. I'm going to give you a point that you should remember. Yes. And Obama, I'm going to do an Obama impression. It's going to embarrass us both. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at impressions. It's okay. But Obama does this thing that I just, I find so interesting. So Obama uses a downward inflection. So we talked about the question inflection, right? Uh -huh. So when we go up at the end of our sentences, Obama goes down at the end of his sentences. He literally slings down his words. And downward inflection we hear is very authoritative. So I'm going to do an Obama impression. Okay, okay so this me. is him slinging down his words. He goes, Sasha, Malia, it's very important that what we do today is going to be remembered forever. And if we don't do those things, 
we are going to be in deep trouble. I, that's a terrible Obama impression, but you can yeah, hear yeah, what yeah. I'm saying, right? Of course. He slings his words down, and that is very authoritative. So even that vocal cue makes us think, well, he knows what he's talking about. Mm, right. It's more authoritative, more confidence. It's more authoritative. Versus if he mm. were to say, Sasha, Malia, I have something really important to tell you. It's really important we do this for our future. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine <laughs> if he gave speeches like that? And so even that vocal inflection worked for him because and he also creates a lot of space in his mouth. He has a lot of space in the middle part of his mouth. So he mm. talks very deeply in his mm. mouth and that helps keep his resonance really low because he's has a space in the back yeah. of his mouth and that creates a lot of resonance. It's a good. Thank you. It's a good impression. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, that was good. You're not embarrassed for me? Good. No, it's great. It's because he creates this, this low resonance point uh -huh. and we like it. Uh -huh. So that's that downward inflection is really important. So many great cues in here, the power of the pause, the pause for power. So a mistake that I used to make is I would pause the end of my sentence before continuing on to my next sentence and I'd get interrupted, right? So the, a mistake that people will make is they'll give a thought, pause, and then keep speaking. Now, pauses are quite powerful. Powerful people typically use pauses in their speech. But if you pause in between your sentences, people will interrupt you because they think you're done. You're actually better off using what I call a, a power pause. A power pause is when you pause right before you give something away. <laughs> <laughs> so not, I the, do it? <laughs> not the end of a sentence. Right. In the middle of a sentence, before you're going to share something. Really important. So let me tell you something really important. Then then that's it, that's it. it. exactly. Yeah. So like, so, so the, here's the mistake that people make is they'll say, something really important happened in my childhood that I want to tell you about. Pause. It was when I was, okay? Mm -hmm. People are like, should I talk to you? Should I ask you another question? Right, what right. should I say? It actually creates conversational confusion, which is the last thing you want. Versus, I want to share a really important story from my childhood. Mm -hmm. That creates a lot more intrigue because mm -hmm. like a story, f oh, from your childhood. And I, I have no desire to interrupt. So that's an, a very advanced tip. That's that's towards the end of the book. It's a sure. very advanced tip because if you have trouble with people interrupting you, I would practice switching your pauses and think about that. What's the drama mm. you can give? Drama. <laughs> yeah. Create the drama. Volume pauses. Yeah. And, and by the way, Obama did that very well. He would he would deliver a point. Right. He would go into his residence and he would say, "What this country needs is better." Systems, mm -hmm. right? I'm saying nothing, but you're like, what's better? <laughs> what's, what is it? You know, what is the thing that we need? It's yes. yeah. not what you say; it's how you say. That's it. it. Um, although, although how you say it is important too. That's oh, you need the confidence. That's too, the last yeah. chapter. So the last chapter I have to end on is verbal, uh -huh. because yes, we spend a lot of the book talking about nonverbal and vocal, but your words matter, as we talked about with achievement-oriented words. Yes. But man, if you can deliver <sighs> achievement-oriented words with power pausing, with a Gear. steeple. Look out. Look out, world. But there are cues within the first five seconds. Yes. Probably, right? Maybe, very much. maybe sooner than that. I, I think that it happens the moment you first see someone. Within, um, a, within a second. With, within a second. And that, uh, that has proven as well online. Like a lot of our first impressions are actually happening digitally. Mm. Right? Someone emails you for the first time. They Google you. They see you on LinkedIn. See a photo, whatever. That's it. That's your digital first impression. Everything matters in what you're putting out. Every, every angle, every smile or not yeah. smile, it can be like misread. I, I think if you way, think right? of it like an algorithm, right? So like if you think of, okay, my LinkedIn profile is a piece of my information that I'm putting out there as well as like my email signature mm -hmm. as well as my dating profile name. I should just have you like break down oh, everything yes. that I do and just say, no, this is yes. wrong. Yes. Well, can I give you a really quick tip on dating profiles? Are you on sure. dating profiles right now? I've got a girlfriend. Yeah, okay. So yeah. if <laughs> anyone, who's on, anyone who's on dating profiles, <laughs> yes. not Lewis. Yes. <laughs> I'm not on anywhere. <laughs> It I've is. never been on. I was on Tinder for like three days because what happened? this Did was it years explode? ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. <laughs> it was my friend. Uh, I'll 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 take his. I won't say his name. He's oh, pretty well bad. known. I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> he was like, "Get on here. It's amazing." And I just it's as an experiment. Just get sure. on there, right? Okay. And so for three days, I do it, and I'm like, getting, <laughs> "It's crazy, right? It's like madness. It's addictive. You're swiping yes. all the time." And I'm like. And then it was just like, okay, I had a bunch of matches or whatever. And I was like, this is just exhausting. Yeah. It's so exhausting. Yeah. And I just deleted it after three days. I was like. You didn't even see anyone? No, I had a couple of text conversations with people and I never saw anyone. But oh. here's the thing. I mean, I'm so like forward with like saying hi to someone if I like them. Yeah. That you if don't... I'm single, that I'm not like, I need to find someone to like sure. match with me. It's not uncomfortable for me to like 
see anyone and stop them. Right. And so say, hey, you know, you know that you don't have to optimize in that area. I don't have to. Because you don't need the intro. I don't need to. And, and, but I, you know, I had to learn how to do that because I could never do that. And I think I told you this when I was uh, 16, 17. I didn't have like, you know, the good looks. I didn't have anything. And I was terrified of girls when I was yeah. in high school. And so for a summer, I made it a mission. No. I said every <laughs> single day, no. I think I was 15 going into junior year. <laughs> Every single day, I was like, uh, whenever I see a girl that gives me butterflies, I have to go towards <gasps> her and, and talk to her. And then it was like, I have to go every ask her. Every day? Every day, I saw a girl, a girl for the whole summer. It was an experiment that I gave myself. I yes. was kind of like a mini you. Yes. I was like, I need to overcome this fear. This is BS. Like, I want to be able to talk to girls and not be afraid. And like, I always stumbled over my words. I just yeah. couldn't get anything out. Yeah. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah. So I said, every day, whenever I see a girl that I'm like, have butterflies, I'm going to go run to her. Not like literally, like, but like, yeah, not like, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to go up to her and just say hello. And then it was like, ask her for her number. And then it was just like, ask her out. It was like yes. another challenge. And by the end of the summer, I was like fluent in the art of like asking girls. To the approach, the yeah, ask, I was just like, the opener. And even if it didn't like work out or if they were like, no, I was just like, at least we had like a fun interaction and it was like, okay, yeah. you know, and yeah. I learned how to gain confidence through taking action and giving myself a challenge. Oh my gosh. So if anyone is listening and feels brave, if they, it's the greatest thing it, that is like, so the I, greatest. one of the biggest challenges, I think we have to think about our life like a big experiment. Yes. And the problem is as adults, we did this when we were kids, right? Like you would play with something or you would, you would try something out. Uh, mm-hmm. You would take a class just cause you were curious. Now as adults, we're like, I can't, I can't try anything because what if it becomes forever or what if it's mm-hmm. permanent? Or what if there's a risk? I think that every interaction is an experiment. And when you think about it that way, you become so much braver, right? You think, Super okay, brave. I'm nervous about approaching that VIP or that girl or that guy or whoever. That butterflies, those butterflies are a chemical signal for me that there is something here, right? Like you there should, is an experiment that I can you have should do it, yeah. and I should do it. So there's a couple things when you're approaching, if, if you're, if this is something that you want to work on, whether it's mm-hmm. a VIP or yes. a stranger or a significant other. So there's um, a girl. A girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's um, the approach and the open. So the approach is actually very important because that's usually when someone's first impression is made. So when you're approaching someone, you want to signal a couple things. You want to first signal friend, not foe. So friend, right? Like, and I heard this last time. Yes, the, hands, the eyes, hands. perfect. First okay. thing people look at is the hands. Yes, go, go, go. Listen to that episode if you if you didn't hear that. No, it's great. Yeah, the first thing, keep your hands out of your pockets. Hands out of your pockets and hand first if you want to do a handshake or a hug, eye contact. Great. Then there's the approach, the verbal, which we didn't get to talk about last time. Mm-hmm. So what people don't realize is actually the verbal approach matters very little, and that is because in the first few seconds of interaction. There's a lot of chemical reading going on. There's a lot of decoding. The verbal becomes sort of secondary. It doesn't matter. That's why the, hey, how are you, is one of the best openers you can do because it it doesn't actually necessarily mean anything. It doesn't take brain power It doesn't either, take so. a lot of brain power. The first question, however, is important. So after Well, you, hey, how are you is a question, but yeah, after that. But is it really, though? Like, we never yeah, yeah. really- It's more of like a- Nah, good kinda, to meet you. Right. Yeah. So like, I, I, my, my approach is usually just, hey, my name's Vanessa. Yeah. Like, or hey, nice to meet you. So it's not even a question. Yeah. That first question, though, is when you want to have some kind of a spark. This is a way that you signal to someone else, this interaction is going to be different. Meaningful, interesting, unique. Fill in the blank, what your intention is for the social interaction. Mm-hmm. So you set up someone's response based on the kind of trigger that you ask. So for example, if you say, so what do you do? I'd be bored. You've signaled, I'd be like, Peace. yeah. You've signaled autopilot. Yeah. I don't really want to think deeply about no, this, and I'm care. judging you on what you do, which might or might not be true. Yeah. I would much prefer, and I call these conversation sparkers. These are these um, very dopamine producing. Dopamine is like a pleasure chemical that gets people excited, and you can actually do this with the words you use. Have you ever talked about priming on the show? I don't know if I've ever heard we can you talk about it. Yeah, yeah, like so, priming was one of those things that I I never thought about this way. But the words you use signal things for other people. So, for example, if you say exciting, mm-hmm. the other person immediately looks for hits, not misses. So, if you say to someone, um, "What are you most excited about lately?" Right, they're immediately in their brain going to search for anything in their like life that hits that. If you say, "Hey, have you been busy recently?" They immediately then search for hits for busy. 
So that's actually a very powerful thing to know because your words dictate everything, including in emails, right? If you're sending an email to someone saying, hey, we're meeting on Friday, we're really crunched on time, um, I'm, I'm a little worried about um, getting everything done, so uh, hopefully we can make it all happen. It seems stressful. It's a very, you're actually cueing the person. To feel stress. To feel stress, worry, and crunched for time. Oh man, that sucks. Right. It's like anxiety, like, oh, I got to do this now. And you are, you are in control of it, like you're creating it. Whereas if you look at your emails, you're like, what am I priming with this email? Like, what am I asking them to search for in their brain? I'm so excited to meet with you on Friday. I can't wait to talk about all the topics we're going to go through. And I know that we're going to be super efficient. Mm. At ease, excited. Yeah. And like, boom, boom. Like you're going to try to get through each thing on your list. Yeah. So that same thing happens with that initial kind of big sparker. So, hey, I'm Vanessa. Good to meet you. Hopefully not. How are you? Because it's not a real question. And then working on anything exciting recently, going on any big vacations. Mm. Hey, do you love this wine? This wine is pretty good, huh? Those are all ways that you're signaling, cueing what kind of interaction you want to have. Mm. And that sets yourself up for success. Yeah. Interesting. So those are the few questions you would ask. Those are exciting. Exciting vacations, vacation, and then what I call context cues. So um, whatever you're doing in the moment, yeah, like exactly. isn't this cool? Or you're like, God, this? isn't this restaurant great? Wasn't that speaker awesome? Mm. Hey, how's the wine? Did you get any drinks? Right. Yeah, so yeah. you'll never run out of things to talk about if you're looking for context cues. Sure, sure. Right. That's like cool. I, I could even I could even be like, Wow, three cameras, Lewis, impressive. Yeah. Okay, now we're talking it's about actually, cameras. It's actually four, but yeah, <gasps> you missed it. Where? It's oh, two on me over there. Yeah. My gosh. <laughs> it's all good. I am impressed. <laughs> four cameras. You just activated my mind to feel like you like me and that yes. you're impressed with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I feel good and at ease. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that that's how it kind of works. One of the questions I like as well is, what are you most grateful for? Mm. And maybe it's not the first one, but it's I like to keep it one of the first few. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's wrong. I don't know. No, but, I love it. I mean, yeah. you're a, I'm triggering you're, gratitude. You're triggering gratitude and you're setting an intention of like, I don't mm-hmm. want to talk about surface. Exactly. Things. Right. Yeah. And yeah. by the way, it goes the other way too. Like if you're with someone who like you're not comfortable with or you're ambivalent about or you don't want to build a deep relationship, mm-hmm. you want to avoid those kind of personal topics because you're not safe yet. Mm-hmm. And that's also a really important internal trigger. There's, um, did I tell you about the skydiver study? When we talked last time, probably. Oh my gosh, this is like one of my favorite new studies. So, what they did is this thing happened to be in New York City. I was in New York City, and um, I was walking by myself after a dinner party into the subway. New York City is like not like I love New York, but like at night by yourself, it's like. "Eh." Mm -hmm. So I was like kind of already nervous, and I walk into the subway, walk on the car, and like immediately I feel fear, like Uh you know that feeling you get like in the pit of your stomach where you're like. And like, I could feel the hairs in the back of my neck stand up. And I was like, what is it? What is it? What is it? And I'm like looking around the car and everything looks fine. And right before the doors close, a guy standing right next to me grabs the purse of the woman sitting, the elderly woman sitting and runs out the doors. No way. Now, thank God people stopped him like within five minutes of like within five seconds of him getting off of the car, got the purse back. But I was like, how did I know? How did you know? So I, I was like, I don't think I'm psychic. Yeah. So there's what else is going on here? So there was a study that was done where they had first time skydivers mm. before they went up in the air, run on the treadmill. They ran on the treadmill enough to get them real sweaty and they had them wear sweat pads to absorb their sweat. They took those sweat pads out. They put them in a new sweatsuit and then they had them jump out of a plane. Took those sweat pads. Obviously get a little sweaty when you're jumping out of a plane. Sure. Then they had participants smell these sweat pads. I know it's kind of gross. See which one was fear or which one's excitement or what? They didn't even tell them what they were smelling. Uh. They put them in a a brain scanner and they had them smell each one. And these people had no idea what was being tested. They didn't even know they were smelling sweat. Okay. Right, right. When the people smelled the sweat pad that was used when they jumped, the person's fear part of their brain activated. In other words, when we feel fear or anxiety, we actually produce a fear chemical. This study kind of blew my mind because it means two things. One is that, three things actually. One, we produce, there's a physical response to the emotion that we feel in, in, the, in a chemical or a pheromone. Second, other people pick that up. And third, mm. not only do we pick it up, we actually mirror it. Like we catch it like a contagion. Mm. Which means that if you, if on that train, I clearly smelled his adrenaline or his fear, right. and it made me very scared. Even though it only happened two seconds later, I could, I could feel that something, something was about to happen. So when you show up to an event feeling either really anxious or really nervous, you're going to create that in other people. Yes. Mm. People are going to catch it from you. 
which is why I do not believe in the phrase fake it till you make it. I don't think that that works. I think that what's much better is figuring out where you naturally rise to the occasion where you already feel strong and confident because I would much rather infect excitement mm-hmm. than infect anxiety. Mm. So we are we have a lot of power in our social interactions. The cues that people catch from us can literally physically not only change our conversation, but change the shape of their entire day. Wow. And so I think that that's where what we're talking about here is not just like, oh, make fun conversation and smile more. It's like, no, you can actually change someone's entire being. Like you can change their physiology. Yeah. yeah. But you've got to have the energy to show up in a certain way. Yeah. And um, it also shows up in the body differently. Like there was a, a really interesting set of studies that looked at how we feel emotion. And they found that um, anger, for example, you have a lot of activity in the chest and the face and in the hands. Like, it, like they're like bright, they get bright red. Because usually we feel that heat in our chest. We're usually yelling if we're mm-hmm. angry. And then we might get into a fist fight. Whereas depression or sadness, we lose activity over our entire body. It's why people who are very sad or depressed want to be in bed, want to be um, uh, they horizontal. No they have literally less activity in their limbs. Um, so there's a lot going on that I think we still, it's very exciting. We have a lot left to learn about people. Yeah. But I think that even what we know so far, there's a lot we can do with it. Mm, amazing. Um, Tell me about uh, PQ. Yeah. What is PQ? Interpersonal intelligence. And I love this because once you're going to tell us what that is in a second, but you have a, a test in the first chapter which tells you how your personality, what is it? Your your interpersonal, your, your level, your interpersonal, interpersonal intelligence. Level. Yes. Got you. How socially like adaptive you are yes. essentially is. Yes. So I'm, I love quizzes. I, uh-huh. I can't help it. I, I, love, I love quizzes. Sure, sure. Um, it's my, my, uh, I love checklists and all those to do boxes and things. So I was very focused on IQ, right? Like growing up, like mm-hmm. book smarts, yeah. technical skills. I never heard about PQ. I never heard about social or emotional intelligence. So there's all these IQ tests and things like that. But I found that it would, what a really good way to start is like where are, where is your smarts, right? Like socially, what are your social strengths? Like we even have like Strengths Finder 2.0. Yep. I'm working on something right now where I want to do like social strengths 2.0. Mm-hmm. Like like what are our social strengths, which are just as important as some of our capabilities. Mm-hmm. And so the quiz is sort of like, okay, where are you at right now, right? Like how good are you decoding? So we're talking about social intelligence. There's really two things we're talking about. Decoding, so spotting cues, spotting hidden emotions, decoding lies, mm-hmm. and encoding. Encoding are the signals that you send out to others. Yeah. So we're kind of, kind of testing both sides of that. Got it. Got it. Um, and I read that people with a higher EQ or PQ mm-hmm. also make more than people. Twenty nine thousand dollars more per year, than, according to this research. Than someone with a a high IQ or a lower. What's lower? The, lower EQ. Yeah, lower EQ. So higher EQ, you're going to make more. That's right. Ninety percent of the time. That's right, and that's because we are interacting with people in ways that we don't even quantify or realize, right? Like every time you send an email, like that email has to be received, processed. There's a difference between having someone respond to it right away and having it sit in their inbox for five days. Yeah. Right. Um, Mm. Negotiating, interviewing, around the water cooler. People still have water coolers in their office. (laughs) Sure, sure. sure. (laughs) Right. Like I, I, and my team is all virtual and I still am using that PQ every day, all day. Mm -hmm. One exercise that sometimes I think about, you can do this if you're listening, is in the course of a day, Make a note of every single interpersonal reaction that you have. It will shock you how many of those there are and how big of an impact they have, right? Mm. Like what, even if it's just like a, a casual coffee, all the possibilities that could come out of that interaction. And then so you make one column where you mark on all the interactions you have. The second column is if that interaction went as good as it could possibly go, what magic could happen for you? So much. So, so, much. so much. But instead, a lot of our interactions are like, Average. So you get average results. Exactly. And when you, you know, I'm thinking about it, I'm probably like, I have hundreds of these interactions yes, a day potentially. You do. Especially with yes. social media and emails and in person. And if you're at events, and like yes, yesterday I was at uh, Oprah's event, Super Soul Sessions. Cool. And there was like, you know, thousands of people, but I met a lot of people. Yeah. Even for like 10 seconds, I met people. Yeah. And I remember there were a number of people, even I just met and gave them a hug. Like they always left a comment like, man, you give really good hugs. Yes. As opposed to just like, oh, nice to meet you, off. Like they always said something yeah. that was like a positive reinforcement. And for me, it's like 
maybe the next time and maybe months when I see them, but they'll remember I gave them a good hug. Absolutely. So that was, you took something in the interaction, mm-hmm. even in 10 seconds, yeah. and you made it above average. Yes. So my I, may, I have awkward long hugs. I try not you to make them awkward, but I try to make them like, <laughs> not like super hugs. awkward, like get off me, but like just a little extra, like an extra second. <laughs> a little extra second. She, like right when they start to pull away, like, I squeeze. No. One a little I bit squeeze more. a little bit more. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I always do yes. that. Yes. Sometimes it goes bad, but most of the time it's worse. I mean, I have a theory that you should greet everyone like they're an old friend. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yes. That's what Hand I do. Hug. That's yes. what I do. Because if you have that mentality, same with an email, mm. you give so much more, like excitement, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, you haven't seen this friend in three years. How would you greet them? That is the way that I like, think ah. you treat most people. Yeah, Maybe not screaming up to them. But <laughs> right? Like that's the girl scream, right? Yes. Two, two girls get together and like yeah, immediately, the vol- I told you like the volume would go up on me <laughs> once I got excited. No, you get Yeah. Because like we, we scream, we go up. Um, what I was going to say also about that, which is really very mm-hmm. smart, is it doesn't need to be a five minute interaction. It can be 10 seconds seconds. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time we focus on productivity. You know, we focus on efficiency. We focus on maximizing our business revenue. Mm. All those things are great. But like if we focus on some of the social aspects of that, it makes it so much easier. Yes. Like let's not just optimize our IQ, our business acumen. Let's also optimize our social acumen because you make that list of every interaction you have and all the good things that could happen if it went really well. It's magic in every mm, other area. Magic. Yeah. And Oh, gosh, that's why I love this stuff. Because I feel like this has really been kind of the the key to my results in my, I would agree. my business in life. Because I would probably have, if I took an IQ test, I probably wouldn't even, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what the rankings are. I don't even know what the lowest is. I'd probably be at the bottom. <laughs> and so for me, it's like I just feel like I stack and stack and stack so much good uh, PQ. Is that right? Yeah. EQ, yeah. PQ. Exactly right. SQ, whatever you're calling it, social. Yeah. And I feel like people care more about how yes. you make them feel, you know, as opposed to how smart you are or whatever. And that quote, that famous quote, I, I think yeah. it's by Maya Angelou. You know, people, people don't care how much you know until they know what you care is one quote. Yes. And then people they remember. They remember what you say, but they remember the way you made them feel. Oh God, quote, quote. <laughs> Those are my two favorite melts. quotes. Yes. yes. So I saw that quote, that second quote, what I just explained with the skydivers, that is the scientific mm. reason behind that quote. So in the book, I talk about these quotes we share yeah. all the time, yeah. like the Dale Carnegie, how to, you know, um, be interested to be interesting. Like, what is the yeah. science behind that? Yeah, not just like, oh, that's a cool right. <laughs> philosophy. Because right. now that Maya Angelou quote, you actually could think to yourself, what emotion do I want to infect today? Right? Like, mm-hmm. is it gratitude? Is it yeah. excitement? Is it yeah. fulfillment? And like, by the way, this doesn't mean that you cannot be vulnerable. Mm. This doesn't mean you, can ha- you, c- you can't have a bad day. Mm. This doesn't mean that you can't go into a meeting and be like, I'm so sorry, like I am feeling really down. In fact, I have those days, we all do. I re- regularly do not cancel meetings on those days. I feel that I would rather go in and say, listen, like I am just I'm off overwhelmed. Today. Yeah, like I'm yeah. off, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sorry for that. Because I also want to catch theirs. <laughs> Right. It's not just a one way street. We don't just infect. I also like to be infected by others. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, and not every time this has worked, but a lot of the time it works when I come to someone and I'm like, I am so stressed about this book launch, right? Like I am, I am terrified. Like recently, fully honest, I am in so much fear. Really? Why? God, I am so. The book? Yes. Why? What are you afraid of? Everything. I'm so, I'm afraid that that people aren't going to like it. I'm afraid that people are going to be like, you're not a real expert. You're an awkward person. How could you write a book? I'm, I'm like afraid that it's going to get out there and be misused or Mm. misrepresented. I'm afraid that I put all this energy into launching, you know, launching is such a big thing and it's going to fail. What's failing? For me, it would be no one reading it. Okay, well, that's not going to happen. I've already read it, so. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, you, succeeded. you had to read it. <laughs> you I succeeded. forced myself onto your podcast. You my, had to read it. My production uh, manager read it. <laughs> so it's okay, two okay, people. Two people. <laughs> Listen, people are going to read it because it's powerful, and it's what people need if they want to get results in their life. If you want to make more money, if you want to have better relationships, if you want to not be in pain and suffering, then um, you, and need I wrote to, it you need for to read them. the book. I wrote yeah. it for me. I wrote it for them. So yeah. I, I think that going in with these these fears is not necessarily a bad thing because then I can say, please infect me with calm. Mm-hmm. 
right? Like you are so calm and so confident that that made me feel better, right? right. You're like, what do you like? What do you mean? It's gonna be great. Like sure. that's I know what this book is. I'm like, right? Like if Lewis knows it, okay? Like Lewis knows it, right? <laughs> but you like, also have proof. Your your blog does well. Your courses do well, and this is like an enhancement of those. So. I I mean, you know, we can we can talk about business models if you want. Mm-hmm. This is was an interesting platform change for me because my platform is B two B and B two C. I've never had a book piece in a platform. Yeah. So it was an interesting addition. Yeah to add in a book piece, which you know, it's, not it's, just online courses. It's challenging. Yeah, it's, it's a new platform play and I'm excited about it, but it's it's different. I've never done it before. It's gonna bring you a lot more opportunities. I hope so. Yeah, it will. I hope so. People always ask, should I write a book? And I've self-published and I've traditionally published and it's that's like a totally different, they're totally different bags, uh-huh. those two buckets. Yeah, what was this publisher again? Penguin Random House Portfolio. Yeah, that's great. And they're fantastic. Yeah, you're gonna be fine. <laughs> <laughs> like you're right. Don't worry about it. Wait, can I, I can I tell you something though? Sure. Okay. So neuroticism. I'm a high neurotic. Uh huh. And I, I people are always like neurotic, it's such a bad word. But neurotic is a way it's a way of talking about emotional stability. You are, I think, low neurotic, yes? You're not very neurotic. You're very emotionally stable. I can have triggered moments that make me frustrated. And, yes. Yeah, but I'm, I think I'm pretty emotionally stable. Okay. But I like things the way I like them. Oh. And so when it's not the way I like it, I, you know. Okay. I get frustrated, but. So that that's about the, the ritual, the, like the habit, the setting things up. So yes. as a low neurotic, you told me it will be fine. Yes. Now, for my high neurotics listening, you <laughs> might know who you are. When people tell you it will be fine, it actually makes you more nervous. Really? Yes. <laughs> you know what? It's not going to be fine. You need to work harder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're screwed. I know. You're going to fail. Okay. So let Is me- Is that what I should say? <laughs> yeah, so, so like when- I know this sounds crazy, but so neuroticism yes. is one of the five personality traits and it is actually, it, it's genetic. And what I mean mm. by that is, um, so how we look at neuroticism is by the serotonin transport gene. I promise this won't get too scientific, but okay. this made me feel a lot of relief when I read this. So serotonin- is a very, very lovely little chemical that makes us feel calm. Mm. It calms us down. Yes. Like if if we like almost um, get hurt and we're like, oh, then like serotonin is what floods our body to say, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Everything will be fine. Serotonin, its mantra is everything will be fine. Right. High neurotics carry a special form of the serotonin transport gene, which means they do not produce as as much much serotonin and it goes more slowly. That's why they're more neurotic. Exactly. Mm. Because when I have something bad that happens to me, it takes me longer to calm down than you. Mm-hmm. So Depends when, on the thing. Totally depends on the thing. On the trigger. Exactly. If I feel like That's I've true. been attacked or something or That's been true. like something has been questioned about me or something or someone did something to me wrong, I feel yeah. like wronged, then sometimes it could be weeks that I hold on to it. Oh, Interesting. It depends on the thing. But other things are going to be like, ah, whatever. Like if someone's like flipping me off in the streets or something or yeah. in, the, in the driving, I'm like, all right, on to the next. Um, so that, Depends, that you know. my friend, is uh, a resource language thing. So that means that you have a resource language of status, which means that if someone has challenged you, that there's a respect mm-hmm. issue, there was a wronging, there was a disloyalty there, Right. your value was taken from you yes. in terms of resources. So there are six, there are six resources, mm-hmm. uh, status, information, money, goods, services, and love. Mm. We all have need all of these resources, yep. but we typically want the resource we did not get in our childhood. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was sexually abused. So for me, when I yes. feel like anyone's taking advantage, advantage of me. It triggers. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely right. So I understand it. You know? Yes, and it threatens you. So when, when you talk about neuroticism, mm-hmm. someone who cannot self-calm as much, they are more anxious because they uh, know it will affect them for longer. Mm, right? So become more anxious, yeah. Right. So that is, affect me. Ah. So I hire people who will worry for me. Mm, like not yeah. literally, I don't have yeah. like official warriors on my team, but my lovely team, like I will say, Danielle, can you just Go worry for about this for yeah. me? Like, <laughs> That's smart. Can you just wor-? Because I know that if she's worrying about it, I don't have to. Yeah. So smart. you'll notice that in relationships, wow. partnerships with colleagues, you have to be able to ask for your resource theory. You have to be able to ask for things that will keep you calm. Can you take care of this for me? Can you handle this for me? Exactly. And what your trigger points are. So for a high neurotic, um, it might be um, emotional stability, right? Like worry or anxiety. And having someone else share that worry with you makes you feel better. So in a typical male-female relationship, typical, and this is Mm -hmm. not everyone. Generalized, yeah. Generalized, the woman is the warrior, the man is not the warrior. Not always, but sometimes. So for example, in my relationship, my husband is the rock, right? So I'm really worried about something and he'll be like, it'll all be fine, babe. And that makes you even more worried. Yes. 
because I want to know that I'm not the only one worrying. So what if he says, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'll handle it. Okay. Now we're getting better. Okay. Yeah. Then you that, can say, yeah. all right, he's going to take care of it. Ooh, I like that. Especially if he's then actually going to you can let go of it? Yeah. Uh, it, I get on the way Quicker. Now. Quicker. <laughs> <laughs> right. Here, here would be the ultimate. The ultimate like, I got thing. this. Here, I'll show you. Go do something else. Oh, see, that's that would like be magic. Right. If he was like. <laughs> does he not yeah. do that? He does. Now he does do that. Yeah, because right? he communicated he knows. what you need. Yeah. Right. So he'll say, like, I'll be worried about, I don't know, I don't know, like planning something for oh, an right, in-law right. trip or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Right. And he'll be like, babe, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to book the flights. I'm going to let my mom know about our timing. We're going to make sure that we have early reservations mm. and we're going to make sure that all these things Maybe are taken care of. pack a week in advance. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the packer actually. Oh, really. yeah. I pack as he does the travel. Sure, sure. Right. So like that, like I think that when we talk about how we're wired, mm. it helps us not want to change the person we're with. Mm -hmm. So the biggest mistake, especially when we're talking about personality or resource language, is we hope that we can make someone better. The problem is, is that we are wired a certain way. 35 to 55% of our personality is genetic. The rest is shaped in early childhood. Mm -hmm. So yes, while we do have some ability to change our personality, that's called free trait theory. Yep. You can optimize parts of your personality to achieve your goals. Yeah, and you can be aware of it and so you can move out of a shifter. 100%. Yeah. It is much better to figure out how can I work with my partner, colleague, friends, resource language need or personality in a better way. So for example, one of the um, personality traits is openness. So openness is like adventure, adventure, adventureness, mm -hmm. creativity, new ideas. People who are high open always want to try new restaurants. They want to go to new places. They're always trying new ways of doing things in their business. They're the mm. boss that's like, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's do this. Low open people love habit and tradition and routine. They love having things set up the same way every time. Mm -hmm. They like to honor that, that routine. It makes them feel whole and one. So if you have people in a relationship, where someone's high open. They're opposites. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're like constantly you're con you're stressed. Constantly, you don't have to be, but you're constantly stressed. It yeah. would be better to be like, for the high open person to be like, hey, I, it's really important to me to be adventurous with food. Trying new restaurants is a thing. Is that okay with you? I'm totally okay with having the morning routine be the same, yes. having our grocery shopping yeah. be the same. Smart. But on this area, that makes me feel alive. We're going somewhere different. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or do I need to have a friend who's my adventurous eater? Right. Yeah. That that's like a I think something that we don't always negotiate in that way. And as mm -hmm. soon as you have the language, it makes it a non hot button issue. Right. So instead of I want to try a new place, you always want to try a new place. That's a hot button issue, right? Versus yeah. hey, like Thursdays are our our night out night. Um, are you open to trying somewhere new, or should I call my friend George? Right. Right. Like that's a very different kind of conversation. Absolutely. And my goal is not to get rid of your fights; it's to make them discussions. Yeah. If you have a profile picture, a dating profile picture, a LinkedIn profile picture, I either want you neutral or with eye crinkles. The worst is sort of that in between. Now, I don't mind like a soft up mouth, right? So you and I both have this on our book covers, mm -hmm. a soft up mouth, but it has to engage those upper cheek muscles. What Dr. Barbara Wilde found is that when they showed pictures of people with the fake smile and a real smile, the real smile was contagious. So when people looked at the real smile, they themselves felt happier. Mm. When they looked at the fake smile, they felt no mood change. Interesting. So the reason why that's important is I think that we think about like, oh, I want to show up. I, I want to be really my most confident self. But what we don't realize is that our cues are contagious. Yes. That if you show authentic happiness, you are more likely to infect happiness. Actually, there's one more face cue I want to talk about. So um, this is the cue that sort of started me on this crazy journey and it got me I'm a recovering awkward person as yes. you know so this introvert. gave me a lot of relief Very, uh, introvert awkward person social anxiety all the good things so <laughs> so this story gave me so much relief what they found was if you are in a room and someone gives you a cue of social rejection what does that look like okay so social rejection eye roll a, a sigh looking away looking right looking away distancing behavior when we pull our head back and like uh when i angle my head back you know i've just disengaged from you crossing arms and crossing arms a sudden see a sudden nonverbal rejection is this turning feet also turning yes we oh we can talk oh, about feet yes. okay we can talk about feet hands and feet are <laughs> so you know interesting i look at the hands and feet all the time i can't remember if i got this from you me, years ago it's it like looking at the hands and seeing are they in the pocket are they out of the pocket yes uh, but go ahead. Before okay. We'll get back okay, to that. Okay. So social rejection cues, and you know this. If you're in a business meeting and you suddenly feel like, "Am I disliked? Oh, he's not. He doesn't like this. She doesn't like this." When we see a cue of social rejection, 
our field of vision increases. We see wider. We literally see wider. Our pupils dilate,、yeah. so we see more. The reason why that study was like a light bulb for me was our cues are affecting others' physiology. Our physiology can change in a room in an instant. If we walk into a meeting and we feel not liked, if we feel rejected, if we feel like we're being judged. Our own physiology responds. So, if we're in a room and we're not feeling confident in our control, and someone sends us a cue of rejection, one, you want to know what those are because it makes your field of vision bigger, so you can see who else is sending me a cue. What's my escape route? That's literally what your body is、yeah, trying to do.、Yeah. Ups your adrenaline, ups your cortisol, and no one can think well. Adrenaline, and cortisol. That's why in a meeting it can go downhill so quickly. Yeah, you're in a presentation, you prepare it all week,、uh, you're like, and、yeah. then you're like, oh, he just rolled his eyes. Oh, she just turned away. Oh, the, I just saw a weird foot movement.、Uh -huh. And then you lose your spot, you blank out, and the rest of the presentation goes badly. The good news is, is what、uh, Matthew Lieberman found. This is from UCLA. Once you label a cue, so if you say that was an eye roll, that was a scoff of exasperation, that was a contempt smirk. The moment you label it, your amygdala calms down. They've proven that if they, when people are in fMRI machines and they show them a fearful face, so fearful face is when we widen the whites of our eyes and we、mm -hmm. raise our eyebrows up. If, if you're laying in an fMRI machine and you see fear, you will begin to feel afraid.、Mm. Your amygdala begins to activate, and your body goes, "Well, if he's afraid, I better be afraid." But the moment you say in the in the fMRI, "That's just fear," your amygdala stops responding. Interesting. So I think I've had a really hard time finding confidence. It's been a long lifetime journey. The way that I've sort of backdoored into confidence is control. If I can control the cues that are being sent to me, if I can control the cues I'm sending to others, it's a secret backdoor into confidence. How do you control someone else's cues? You label them and respond appropriately. So, so you can't control how they act towards you, but you can control how you、yeah. react to it, how you interpret it, how you、mm -hmm. transition afterwards. Yes, like you can first by labeling it, you just controlled your own physiology. So, if someone sends you a contempt, an eye roll, you just took control. You took control back of. Nope, I see it. I spot it. I'm disengaging it. You know, in the vulnerability world, when you, you know. Label the shame when you speak about the shame and you bring it to the light. It becomes less scary.、Mm -hmm. It doesn't stay stuck inside of you. So even just acknowledging it is a helpful tool to process shame or I guess and fear social rejection. Social rejection. Ah, it's the same actually. So for vulnerability, yes, you're afraid. You acknowledge it. It makes it less scary.、Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in social settings,、mm -hmm. dates, professional situations, negotiates, interviews. The moment you say, okay. I just heard an exasperated tone of voice, or I just saw a lid flex. That's the one I want to talk about next. A what flex? I know, I know. A, a lid flex. A lid flex. Is that an eyelid? <laughs> yes, is it, it like is. A, like a like a like a twitch or okay. what? Okay. Okay. So here you ask,、like mm, how do we control?、Mm, oh yeah, that's it. You、yeah. just did it. Okay. So you know Zoolander? Yes. You know the blue steel? Of course. Okay, that is actually a lid flex, right? So that's a.、Mm. Right. It's like a, it's if you if you're listening right now, harden your lower lids and then like、mm, your lips.、Mm. That's what blue steel is. The funny thing about this cue. It's ridiculous. I know you're like, where are you going with this? No,、Vanessa? it makes sense to me because it's like, prove me. You're like, someone's doubting you. Oh, you just got it. Yeah, okay. So what's funny is, in fear, our eyes widen. So if you widen your eyes as wide as possible, so you can see the whites, you just I can take in way more of my environment. When we're afraid, we want to see as much as possible. When we are trying to see details,、mm -hmm. universally across cultures, we have to lessen the light coming into our eyes. So we squint. The focus. We focus. So if you like, if you were to try to see that dot over there on the wall, you harden your lower lids,、uh -huh. and that is because scientifically proven, when we harden our lower lids, it reduces the amount of light, and we can see more details.、So、gotcha. Like, I can see the details on that camera better when I lower lid flex. Squint. Yeah. This is why, if you open People magazine's Sexiest Man Alive, on almost every page, along with a flexed bicep, are flexed lids. And that is because、really? women find a flex lid oh so attractive. When they when <laughs> so attractive. So an open lid is not sexy. No, is it sexy? <laughs> no, a flex no. lid is. No, yes, because why? Women and men both want partners who are deeply scrutinizing, who are deeply looking at them. So if I'm、mm. sitting when talking to you and I go, oh really? I just showed you. Wow, that was super interesting. In fact, when we flex our lids, we're going from just listening. To thinking deeply. Interesting. We're literally trying to see something better. So if you're in a negotiation, or on a date, or with a friend, and they go really, and they harden their lower lids, you are like, ooh, ding ding, I just hit something good. 
And so the other way that we control cues is, okay, let's say that you're, and this actually happened to me, so this is a story I share in the book. I was in a meeting with a very uh, high-powered exec team, and if the, if the presentation went well, they were going to invite me back for more presentations. So the stakes were very mm -hmm. high, and it was a small group. And I was in a particular part of my presentation talking about chemicals. And I noticed an executive across the room flexed his lower lids at me, kind of flexed his lower lids. He's looking at the slide. And I was like, OK, what's happening? He just went from listening to scrutinizing. And so I paused with a small group. And I said, all good? Any questions? And I literally looked right at him. And I opened up my palms. And I said, any questions? So this is the universal signal for openness. It literally means I want to receive. I'll share anything you want. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's literally like, let me receive, let me be open to you. And he went, yeah, you know, I do have a question. And at the time I was teaching about oxytocin. Oxytocin, I, I know you talk about it a lot on the show, the chemical of connection and bonding. Uh -huh. He goes, I don't understand something. Isn't oxytocin what they give women to induce labor? And I'm like, you are right, sir. They do give oxytocin. And that's because it's so powerful that it can induce labor. Interesting. But in our position, it's for social bonding. It was such a good teaching moment because he immediately felt heard. And I know that if I hadn't addressed that concern right then and there, I would have lost him. Mm -hmm. He would have been like, what? He would have been stuck on that one slide. And afterwards, he said to me, you know, I really feel like you were teaching to us. Teaching and to me. I, I, yeah, literally yeah. teaching to him. And so I think the other way that we can control the cues is we spot it and then we say, how can I honor it? Like, that's the gift that we can give people mm -hmm. is yes. I can be sitting with someone and say, I want to listen to you so deeply. I want to listen to your words. I want to watch your facial expressions. Yeah. I want to listen to your nonverbal. I want to even listen to your voice tone. I mean, we haven't even talked about vocal power, which mm -hmm. here is incredibly important. And not only do I want to spot mm -hmm. that, I want to respond in the way that you may, you feel the most heard by me. So it's spotting and honoring. And by doing that, if you're in a presentation, whether you actually acknowledge the person or not, are you just saying that it'll bring you back to a more centered place so you can continue on the presentation? Exactly. It makes you feel in control of the narrative. Gotcha. It makes you feel in control of, and like even for introverts, right? Like introverts, it's much harder for us to share a lot of verbal content. So for us, I want to give you more control over the nonverbal so that when you do speak, it's more mm -hmm. powerful, right? So if you're an introvert and you want to make sure you are reading the room really quickly so you know exactly when to say your point so it's most heard and most valued, that gives you confidence because you're not guessing. Yes. I don't like the guesswork. No, I don't either. I know. You see a lot of these videos online talking about how charismatic someone is based mm -hmm. on the way they smile, their eyes, mm -hmm. they, the tilt of the chin, or uh -huh. all these different things. <laughs> is it important to be charismatic? Let's mm -hmm. talk about that first. Yes. Is it valuable and more important to be charismatic versus less charismatic? Mm -hmm. Less... To the point. Yeah. Yeah, credible. Yeah, to the point or, or neutral mm -hmm. energy. I mean, what's more valuable in society, in accomplishing goals and mm -hmm. getting what you want. Mm -hmm. okay. Very charismatic or neutral? Neutral. Okay, so this is the biggest mistake I think facing really, really smart people. I think really, really smart people, and this is most of my students, they're like off the charts, smart, creative, brilliant. They make the mistake of thinking, if I have enough book smarts, if I have enough technology smarts, I don't need the people smarts. Mm. Now, here's what research from Princeton University found. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited yeah, for this. Yeah, okay. Because I already know what's gonna, what you're okay. going to say in a sense. Yeah. Okay. So this study completely changed my work and changed my life. It was done by Dr. Susan Fisk in 2002. And since then, they've been able to replicate it and build on it and build on it. So this is very solid research. What she found, very highly charismatic people have to have the perfect blend of two traits. And this is where it's really, mm -hmm. this is why highly charismatic people are so unique. And this is why we love them so much. <laughs> to be highly charismatic, to be compelling, to be captivating, you must have a perfect blend of warmth and competence. Mm -hmm. and we talked about this the very, very first time we met, but since then, so much more has come out about it. Very, very smart people make the mistake of showing up as all competent. They try to blow you away with their mm -hmm. numbers and their facts and their stats and their data but they're seen as cold. Yeah. They're seen as intimidating. On the other side, you have people who are highly warm. They have competence, but there's not a balance. They show up as highly likable, highly friendly, but they're interrupted. They're told that they're not being taken seriously. They're not credible. Right, yeah. they're, people forget having met them before. Mm. And so I think that most people problems, I'm, I'm even gonna say all people problems. I mean, because all people problems stem from an imbalance between your warmth and competence. And so not only do I think that charisma is essential for being successful, 
I actually think it's the only way that people will be open to your competence. So you could be all the book smarts in the world. Yeah. You could have the highest IQ and remember everything on any test, or you could be an encyclopedia yeah. of wisdom and yeah. information. But what I'm hearing you say, if you don't have charisma, mm -hmm. at least some of it, mm -hmm. then people won't take you seriously or they won't care as much or they won't be as engaged. It's not just engaged. There's two questions that humans ask themselves about the person they're with. And this happens immediately in every interaction. By the way, video too. We forget that this is not just in person. This is happening the moment you pop on video. It's happening the moment someone opens your LinkedIn profile. I did a whole bunch of research on LinkedIn profiles specifically because that's where a lot of our first impressions yeah. are happening. Okay, when people see your LinkedIn profile, when people see you on video, on Zoom, the first question they ask themselves, and it is chronological, the first question they ask is, can I trust you? Basic instinct, are you gonna be my ally or my enemy? Can I trust you? The very second question they ask is, can I rely on you? So when you're in a meeting, on a date, in a call, in a pitch, a negotiation, on LinkedIn, the two signals that you wanna cue people with as quickly as possible is, yes, you can trust me, and yes, you can rely on me. The problem is, is that most professionals right now are going mute. So I don't know if you've noticed this, but it feels like in the last five or 10 years, we've gone towards ambivalence. You know, we've gone towards, I'm not gonna show anything. I'm going to be as professional and sterile as possible. And so mm -hmm. we've taken out cues mm -hmm. from all these assets and then people have a really hard time trusting us. Mm -hmm. They have a really hard time listening to us. We wonder why people are slow to reply to our emails. It's because we're not queuing enough. We have to have hundreds of cues to, feel, to answer those two questions. Interesting. So how do we create more trust and reliability instantly? Yes, okay. So here, let's talk about trust first because it is chronological. We have okay. to trust someone to rely on them. That's mm -hmm. why starting with your competence doesn't always work. Mm. So trust. So the very first thing, it's a weird one. It's a really weird one that I'm gonna talk about first. So you don't have to be competent to be trusted. To be charismatic, you have to be competent and trustworthy. Okay. Right? So we want that perfect mm. balance, yeah, right? You're, you're, you're trying to- smart enough and you're warm and yes. likable. Yeah, okay, and okay, so like, let's look at this cover. So really, really successful book covers, mm -hmm. just like really successful LinkedIn profile pictures, very quickly signal both trust and competence, mm -hmm. right? They both signal both these at the same time, okay? So um, let's talk about the first one, which is space, space zones, okay? So, sorry, I'll give it back to you. I took it away. <laughs> Space zones? Space mean, zone. What is We're gonna talk space about space. Zone? We're gonna talk about the distance between people. So the distance between my nose and the camera lens. You mm. can't see it. But in this photo shoot, I made sure that the distance between my space and the camera lens was a certain space. How far? So I wanted to be in what's called the, the social zone. Okay, so and this is not made up by me. This is actually uh, research is based. There's four zones for people. The intimate zone, the personal zone, the social zone, the public zone. Remember that um, Seinfeld episode if you ever saw of close talking? Yes. You ever had this where someone walks up like right into your face that, that, and like yes. talks into your mouth? Uh-huh. Okay. So that's called close talking. And that is the first big rule. Intimate zone. Intimate zone. You when don't want to be there. You don't want to be there unless you're about to get intimate. Or unless you like your friends or you know each other and you're like, that's Lewis, what you do. Do you talk six inches away from your friends? Oh, that's friend? too close. No, yeah. no, no. That's okay. like your girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. So you're your partner. <laughs> right. Got okay. you. Okay. Okay. So here's what happens. This is intimate zone. Six inches. S Zero to 18 okay, inches yeah. apart okay, is intimate yeah. zone, okay? So here's what happens. This is the biggest mistake I'm seeing right now is we're all on video call all the time. You're taking photos like yes. this, selfie, like yes. what does that do when you're projecting a video or a photo of that close? It is literally saying, I wanna get close really, really fast. And so if you have someone who's super high warmth, they're like, yes, mm. vulnerability, mm. intimacy, and you're gonna attract those kind of people. But if you have someone who's like, whoa, 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 mm -hmm. take a minute, they are, they are turned off. So what's happening is on video calls, you hop on FaceTime, you hop on video or on Zoom, and people are like right up in their camera. It's, yeah. right? their, their nose and their camera are, are, are 10 inches apart. And so someone's like, whoa. It's too close. Yeah. It's too close. Okay. So that's the first one is you want to respect the space zones. The, the sweet spot is a foot and a half to three or four feet away. That's, mm -hmm. that's that social zone. That's where we're making eye contact. If I wanted to reach out and high five you, I could. We're still respecting each other's space. So for those, one is when you're on video, in your photos, that if you want to have that balance, you want to be 18 inches to about three or four feet away. Okay. That's the so, first one. Social zone is 18 to three feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the personal zone, by the way, is still good, but that's a little bit farther away. Right? So that's... Uh, you're just starting to get to know each other. When you see someone across the room or a boardroom or a networking event, they're usually about 
um, four to seven feet away, which is the next zone, which is the personal zone. Okay. And then you have the public zone, which is obviously from far away. What okay. we like in human behavior is we like someone to come towards us slowly. That's one of the reasons I think we're so burnt out on video. You know, we, we have these back to back to back video calls and we wonder, why are we so tired? I'm not even in person. The reason is because it's cueing us in ways that are not natural. In person, I walk into a room, right? Like I walked into the office today and you were waiting. I was like, hi, and we, yeah. and then we hugged. That was the, per that's the way humans like, right? It's like this from public. So it's not like you open the door and I'm right there standing in your face. <laughs> that would have been a lot. I was a few feet back. You were a few feet like, back. Yeah. It was perfect, right? <laughs> so like that, that's natural. But on video, it's like, whoop. We're here, and that's why yeah. we can get so fatigued is because the cues are unnatural, which actually leads me to the second kind of trust cue that's important. Yes. Is when we can't see someone's hands, our brain has a really hard time trusting someone. So funny, I think ever since that interview, I'm always keeping my hands out. Yeah. I don't think I was keeping yeah. my hands in before, but I think I'm just more aware of it when I'm walking by someone who might be a stranger. I just have my hands out and relaxed and yes. loose, but my, you know, I'm not yes. like, tight or tense and I'm not like hiding them or anything. Yes. It's just, yeah, just walking normal and say, hey, how's it going? You know, I'll uh, even do like a little it. wave, yeah, just to show. That's super hey, charismatic. Say, hey, good to see you. you know? That's it, that's it. So when we, so I love Shark Tank. Do you know that yeah. show? Okay, I, love I know it. you had I love it. Friday nights, oh, Shark Tank. Shark Tank. So I wanted to know watching Shark Tank, was there patterns between the least successful pitches Interesting. and the most successful pitches? This is cool. Okay, so my team, I love my team. Thank you to my team. Not not on just based on like what people said, but how they said everything. Things. That's cool. Everything. So we analyzed wow. 495 Shark Come Tank on. pitches. Yeah. What were the main things you you saw from okay. those successful and those not? Okay. So thank you to Jose Pena for this research. So 495 Shark Tank pitches. Literally hundreds of hours of Shark Tank. Yeah. Coding every variable we could think of. Entrance, first impression, verbal, eye contact, smiling, interactivity, math deal. I mean, we were looking at everything. Holy cow. Okay. One of the biggest differences between the least successful pitches and the most successful pitches was what you just did. Hands. Right. So when you walk down that Shark Tank hallway, that is beautiful, right? That's, that's exactly what we're talking about, space, right? Public to personal to social to intimate. So it's a nice warm up. The best pitchers, when they were all the way in the public zone, signaled, hey, sharks. No way. And they'd walk into the room, they'd take their place on the carpet, and they'd go, good morning, sharks. Or, hey, Kevin. Mark, we'd love to have a deal with you. They would greet with some kind of hand gesture. The least successful pitchers walked in with, I think they thought they were being humble, but it actually reduced trust. They hid their hands either in fists, behind their backs, in their pockets, or holding a prop. Sometimes accidentally they hid their hands and they didn't hand greet. That makes it really hard for someone to say, I can trust you. And that is a primitive part of our brain that when we can't see someone's hands, like if I were to you know, do this entire interview with my hands behind my back. Like what's she doing back What's there? she doing? Yeah, yeah. What are her hands doing? And what's interesting is mm. um, Susan Goldwyn Meadow researches gesture. She spent her entire academic career researching gesture. And she found that gestures carry more weight than words. Mm. So if a pitcher, a Shark Tank pitcher, were to go on and say, today I have a really big idea. It's right. really big. And I hold my hands up like it's really big. It's really small. You're like, no way. It looks small, Vanessa. It looks so small. It's not big at all. But if I were to say I have three three big ideas and hold up five, you're actually more likely to believe my fingers. So the reason why this is important mm. is because gestures help lower cognitive load. Interesting. When I use gesture, I'm more fluent. I'm mm. able to be more competent. I'm able to underline my words and able to say, this is a really important point. Can I give it to you? Hand gestures, body gestures, facial gestures, hair hand gestures. Gest hand gestures. Hand gestures specifically. Are key. They are like our body language highlighter. That's how I want you to think about them. Not what do I think I'm saying, because everyone's like, oh, I just said this. What did I say? It doesn't matter what you think you said. What matters is what they hear right. when you speak, based off of their viewpoint, their biases, their DNA, their genetic makeup, their, their drama, their trauma, all their stuff, because they bring that in 